out the horrid Roman wedding colors. I mean, they have you out here looking like a Mick bride. I'm talking happy meal. Whoever decided that egg yolk yellow must have been the move, must have hated Romans or women or both. So to paint y'all a picture, the night before her wedding, having given away her childhood dolls, a Roman girl might sleep in a tunkareka, a special white woolen robe she has to have woven herself to demonstrate her domestic skills. If you, let's say, sucked at domestic skills, you'd essentially be wearing like a pillowcase with no arms type of thing. So on the morning of the wedding day, the bride is dressed by her mother and everything she wore has to be cream or a yellow wool. It's the only material harvested from an animal while it's still alive, thus it contained animus, aka spirit. This must seem an absolutely brazenly stupid material choice given the Mediterranean climate, but keep in mind it was fun to be supremely Aryan-like. That doesn't make it any less chafy though, so. On to the egg yolk, aka flamium, the flame-colored or color of egg yolk veil used to cover the bride's hair and shielded her face. It signaled the transition into a matron's pala, a huge rectangular shawl worn by wedded women. But before you slap that rain poncho on her head, don't forget to do the elaborate Sunny Creens hairstyle. What's that mean in English? Intercourse Creens. It's six special braids wound with a bunch of fragrance herbs to do with fertility, but also covers the fact people were smelly. Don't worry. You add more cotton this time to her hair in colorful strips. Last but not least, like your daughter is a present under the tree, you tie her up in a bow. More accurately, a cingulum. It's a wool belt tied with something called a Hercules knot that her husband has to be confident enough to undo on the wedding night. Toss on a pair of neon yellow slippers and you're ready to go down the aisle looking like a crumpled napkin covered in mustard. Let's go. So marriage required giving up a lot of yourself, including your girlhood. Number nine is Bye Bye Barbie. As we all know, girls were married off while still young. But to give you like the smallest semblance of peace, many Roman emperors upheld and enforced that consummation wasn't allowed despite a marriage occurring until a woman reached a certain age. Just to ensure they didn't die unnecessarily and childbirth was a major 50-50 back then. Some women were genuinely barred from giving birth well into their 20s if their family had a bad rep of lady deaths. But the night before a wedding, no matter what happened once the knot was tied, pun intended, and no matter her age, a girl set aside dolls, old hairbrushes, and dresses and donned in matronly garb for the first time and ceremoniously burnt her old items. By dedicating her toys and youthful possessions to the household gods, it became a transition in which she would emerge a woman. Even if you're like 20, you had to do this. I'm sure it didn't have to go as far as burning it, like sheesh, maybe save them for when you have a kid of your own, that way you don't have to remake and rebuy all the stuff again. Or find like a prehistoric value village to donate to, maybe. And while we're giving things away, why don't you take a second and scroll on down to the red button below so you can subscribe to the hive. Now as mentioned, Roman emperors had some more really than a little say in marriage. So number eight is all about how it was governed by law. There were very specific laws governing marriage and these laws evolved depending on the era, the emperor in control, and then when Christianity entered the empire. Pretty consistently, a proper Roman marriage could not take place unless the bride and the groom were Roman citizens or had been granted special permission called a conibium. So more on the laws around that in a later point. At one time in Roman history, those who had been owned people, now freed, were forbidden to marry citizens. This restriction was relaxed by an emperor Augustus who passed a reform in 18 BC called the Lex Julia. So that, by the first century, freed peoples were only prohibited from marrying senators. Augustus instead insisted on other restrictions on marriage. Citizens weren't allowed to marry working girls or actresses, and provincial officials were not allowed to marry local women. Soldiers were only allowed to marry in certain circumstances, and marriages to close relatives were forbidden. Finally, unfaithful wives divorced by their husbands could not remarry. In the Republic, there was a stipulation that if the bride is uh, not deflowered, her husband should only sleep beside her for at least one night without engaging in physical touch. The aim of that was to give women a chance to get used to a new situation. Another thing meant to help her get used to a new situation, number seven, the mutinas tutinas. So we know about this tradition through some very, very angry church fathers and their many documented temper tantrums. One famous account is Christian apologist Arnubus, who angrily scribbled that the Roman matrons were taken for a ride on Tutinus with its immense shameful parts. In reality, what he's actually describing with a lot of hostility and hypocrisy as an obscene loss of purity was actually a ritual that allowed brides to have autonomy and learn not to be embarrassed by the act of intercourse and their bodies role in it in an era where that didn't get to happen. So stop being mad, bro. It can't always be about men. The ritual goes that before the consummation of her marriage, a Roman woman had to go through the process of deflowering herself. In order to do that, she made her way to the temple of Mutinus and the marriage deity, 
and sat on his appendage. She didn't have to do more than a quick sit. If she didn't want to, it was up to the woman. Some wanted to do the sit down, ouch, okay. Time to get up and leave. Got lots of wedding planning to do while other women would you know? So whatever kind of woman you are, once you walked out of that temple, albeit now a little bit bow-legged, you were also now able to have proper relations with your new husband. And a deity being your first penetration would guarantee fertility and healthy children. As also mentioned previously, their society ain't for women not to have relations on the first night anyways, and rather sleep beside their husband. Unfortunately, both these practices degenerated and took women's rights with them. We've done a lot of build-up to it, so let's make number six all about how Roman weddings have one wacky ceremony. First of all, a marriage ceremony was commonly held, although there was actually no legal requirement for such. In law, all that was required was for the bride to be led to the groom's house. The groom did not have to show up. He could quite literally be wed in absentasia via a letter of intent. There's some confusion about which rituals relate to which types of marriage and from what time periods, seeing as there was three kinds of marriage and a lot of different eras of the Roman Empire. Purchase, which is the usual, it's always existed. Usage, super archaic, where a man and woman could spend a year together unmarried, do whatever they want, and once it's hit the one year point, if the woman stays another three days, they're officially married. Then one last came into play later in the empire, and that was alongside Christianity. It had a religious character involved. In earlier times, either a lamb was sacrificed and its skin spread out for the bride to sit on, or a sow was sacrificed to Mother Earth. Either route, an auspex read the entrails to determine the fate of the couple. Then the bride unveiled herself, power move, and the couple stood face to face. In later times, when vows were introduced, she would say, where you are the male, I am the female, and he would respond, ubi tu gaia, ego gaios. Rings or coins were then given to the bride. A contract was signed if it was desired, like a prenup agreement today. Both families could stipulate terms around children and in finances, such as a dowry. The Roman marriage ceremony, called a dextratum incutio, literally means joining of hands. The last component found in all times of the empire was a handshake that signifies the concordia, a mutual bond of affection between the married couple using their right hands. The couple then share a ritual spell cake that the groom broke above the bride's head, not like a bottle style, in a let me crumble this above your elaborate hairstyle to feed your head lice kind of way. And then after the wedding comes the domum deductio. I hope you're curious because the next is trial of curious. In 63 BCE, a trial took place in ancient Rome, which is still shrouded in mystery, even in its own time. And it serves as a reminder why the statute of limitations is in place, because Romans really charged a dude for a 37 year old crime and per dilio, aka the super duper high treason. Saturnius works with Gaius Marius a lot. His support helps Marius in winning seven consulships and securing land for veterans. Things go south though when Saturnius and another friend, Glaucia, are implied for two political slayings and put out a bill saying the lands they owned would re be redistributed to the poor. When have rich people ever liked that news? So he put in the bill if you fight against that, you lose your royal status. When representatives of the Senate came to Marius asking for his help. Marius, even in Plutarch's version, actually feigned a bad case of diarrhea to avoid having to deal with this. In the end, Saturnus and Glaucia are overpowered, forced to surrender, and stoned to death. Marius sadly has to abandon his buddy and moves on in his life for 37 years. One of the instigators against Marius can be identified with certainty. His name was Titus, again, and he must have been in his mid-30s during the trial, but wasn't born when the stoning even went down. But he knew his uncle was one of the victims and felt that was a pretty good way to get some fame and cash. They could have gone after a bunch of other options but Marius, someone who was friends with the victim and weirdly he was their unspecified choice. He was charged with complicity, which he obviously denied, but where the hell was he gonna find witnesses 37 years later when most people died in this time at like 20? Thus, the insane charge of high treason as well as the killings. Cesario, who acted as his defense, had done what he could, but he was no match for the bratty nepotism of Roman hierarchy, so Marius was crucified. Speak with your chest, baby girl, it's Masia of Sentinum. There's lots of notable women lost to history thanks to sexism, but some remain on the blurred line. We know little about her. Her native city is an ancient Ubrian town, and her vague description is dark hair. The only Latin author that wrote of her is Valerius Maximus, and it's in his memorable deeds and sayings text. He paid more attention to the action done by this woman because it isn't in compliance with the social and cultural values of ancient Rome. Masseria is one of those women who, as Valerius writes, were restrained from speaking in the forum and in the courts either by 
by their sex or by the chastity of matronly dress. The men of Masseria's family were involved in the Great Umbrian Revolt of 90. For this reason, they couldn't defend her in court when she was put there in charges. We're not really sure what those charges are. According to the rules of all of ancient Rome, Masseria shouldn't have been able to defend herself, and she was a victim of circumstances. Thus, she was allowed to be able to. Valerius Maximus writes that because she had been accused, Masseria of Sentinum defended her own cause before a great crowd at the court convened Proctor Lucius Titus, and having used all the techniques and devices of defense not only accurately, but also courageously, she was acquitted at the first hearing and almost unanimously. So because she was concealed by a manly spirit in the guise of a woman, they call her androgynous. Nice. Love a poet, but their content is too happy for you? Consider banishment. Worked like a charm in the case of Ovid's exile. In December of 2017, similar to the writer and poet Dante, Rome's council unanimously approved a motion to repair the serious wrong suffered by Ovid, thought as one of the three canonical poets of Latin literature, by finally ending his exile. So, why exiled? Well, we have three factors at play. Ovid's sensual poetry was considered offensive, his attitude to the Emperor Augustus was too disrespectful, and he may have been involved in an unspecified plot or scandal. He was friends with a bunch of the members of the failed coup against Augustus in 6 AD, so it was believed he knew it was going to happen but didn't tell anyone, aka conspiracy. Rumors were also implied that he helped Julia in her many affairs, which scandalized Roman society and pissed off her hubby. And Ovid may have had an affair with the emperor's granddaughter. All we know is that in 8 AD, Ovid is booted out of Rome on personal orders of Augustus without due process. It was a big ol' scandal in the empire, but who's going to say anything? We could go to Ovid for answers on what happened, but exile was brutal for him. He had to leave his wife and kids, so all he'd ever say, it was the result of a verse and a mistake. When Augustus died, the Pope and his family had real hopes under the order of banishment that it would be lifted. Unfortunately, the successor, Tiberius, was a cruel man and continued to forbid the poet's return. He died of unknown reasons in 17 or 18 AD. Imagine seeing Triple on the battlefield and it's not because he got conked on the head. The Hoteius trial. It starts with two sets of triplets and two warring kings. Alba Longa has invaded some Roman territory and the armies of Tullus meet them there where the army then discuss how to minimize the bloodshed, only to notice that both sides happen to have brought sets of triplets to the front. It seems divinely sent, and divinely sent that the gods had this strange coincidence occur, so it was agreed that the two sets of three would be the only battlers. The Roman brothers Horatius and the Alban brothers Coratius duke it out to win and end the war. After two of his brothers are slayed, the final Roman triplet uses a clever strategy to strike down his opponents and win. The armies go separate ways, and Horatius is rejoiced by his people, but not his sister, Horiachia, who is devastated to learn her fiance, one of those three triplets from the Albans, has been killed. Horiachia's great grief angers her brother, after all, they were enemies, and they were responsible for the death of her other brothers. He drew his sword and approached his sister, saying, get lost and some other stuff, I'm not kidding, and swung his sword through her. Record scratch sound effect, everyone went from cheering to, what the hell, dude, and dragged him before the emperor, who appointed a people's assembly. Assembly's conclusion is what he did was effed in the head, and they can't acquit it. While the executioner's by him up, Daddy Horatius pulls up and makes an appeal. He thinks his daughter being killed was justifiable, gee thanks dad, and secondly, he just lost three out of four kids in one day, I know this is messed up, but this is all I've got left. So they acquitted his son on the admiration for his courage rather than upholding law and justice. And last but definitely not least is the very well known trial of Jesus. The only issue is, is the Bible is being so edited and rewritten and redistributed, there are too many different versions of the story to really nail down any real ones. So, here is what we know in layman's terms. Passover, Jesus and his disciples, actually his name is Jesus, are in Bethany for the occasion. The first three gospels say Jesus' first stop was at the temple complex where he flipped some merchant tables in front of it for selling stuff in a place of prayer like it's a Walmart. Valid. According to the general understanding, first proposed by Mark, this event leads directly to the condemnation and death of Jesus. In these first three gospels, Jesus and his disciples have cedar and after dinner they go to over on foot to the Mount of Olives, where the famous prayer to God is known to be agony, since Jesus foresees what is to come and he gets zero response. Where's dad when you need him? The next day, boom, a mob of Roman auxiliaries snatch Jesus up as Judas betrays him with a smooch. Jesus seals his execution when he responds to the high priest question in court, are you the blessed one, the Messiah? To which Jesus goes, heck yeah, dude, I'm the son of come in glory, when God's kingdom is established to judge all humanity. Evidently, the high priest was hoping Jesus was smart enough not to admit to a literal jury, but alas, the high priest has to declare this a crime of blasphemy.
blasphemy and condemns Jesus for inciting Roman rebellion. There are other contributing factors outside of angry Roman leaders. In gospel, he's charged for not telling the Jews to pay taxes to Rome. In John's gospel, condemned because of the growing crowds over his raising of Lazarus. In all four gospels, Pilate is, is portrayed as reluctant to execute Jesus. He attempts to avoid the decision by offering to release another prisoner, Barabbas, and threw a sop over the now anti-mob by letting them decide. No matter, the crowd cries, give us Barabbas, and Jesus is condemned to death for rebellion against Rome, who then crucified. Number 10, three fights in a funeral. This first point is still up for debate as many historians are still trying to confirm how this whole gladiator thing started, but one possible launching point for these bloody Olympics was a blood rite at funerals. They served as a kind of violent eulogy, so instead of standing up in front of the mourning families and reading, I don't know, like a haiku or a poem, they uh, fought out their feelings. Healthy. When esteemed aristocrats died, families would hold bouts between slaves beside the grave, like right there, front row seat for the corpse. This was to demonstrate the virtues that were demonstrated by the dead in life. This presentation of blood in battle also could have stood in for human sacrifice. As you can guess, the tradition would gather quite the crowd and eventually evolved into the epic gladiator battles we know today. Julius Caesar, for instance, organized a massive gladiator fight between hundreds of warriors to honor the death of his father. By the end of the first century BC, the gladiator games were state funded and much, much larger. Number nine, no heckling. When the Colosseum was built in 80 AD, about 50 to 80,000 fans of Roman combat, they would pour in. The energy was high. This was their only source of entertainment, really. They weren't watching The Witcher season two back then, so you know, they had to do this. So some fans would get so into the action that they, of course, would heckle. Well, just like a comedy show, they too can hear you heckle. You're throwing off their entire performance and that's a no-go. Today, a 21-year-old usher will politely ask you to keep it down, but in Roman Colosseum days, you don't get a warning. One of Rome's more violent emperors, Domitian, was pretty die-hard when it came to the Colosseum and the games. So much so that one day, a guy in the crowd heckled a gladiator, probably talked smack about his oiled up abs, or, you know, smile. That's always a fun one, we hear that a lot. So Domitian had him pulled from the audience to the center of the arena, where a group of aggressive dogs finished him off. How terrifying is that? No heckling, ever, even now, stop. Hey Taylor, yeah? stop. Number eight, vegetarians. So believe it or not, the diet of a gladiator was largely vegetarian, though it wasn't really like they had any choice. It was expensive to keep these fearsome warriors and meat wasn't always easy to come by, so they had to fill in the gap with other sources. Based on the excavation of 22 gladiators, their bones revealed that their typical food was wheat, barley, and beans. How they could tell this from their bones, no idea. Science, man. There was little sign of any meat or even dairy as well. However, they did drink another kind of mysterious substance. This study was carried out by the Medical University of Vienna in Austria and the University of Bern in Switzerland. And not only did it reveal the aforementioned vegetarian diets, it also showed evidence that they consumed a health boosting tonic made out of plant ashes. It can be compared to the way we consume magnesium tablets or vitamin C. It was believed that it helped restore gladiators after a battle. Now, obviously, 22 is a a pretty small sample size, but hey, that's still at least that percentage, so. Number seven, death before combat. With most of these Roman gladiators, they are trained, they understand a specific style of combat, and they're paired off with an opponent that's somewhat equal. But not all of these gladiators are UFC fighters. Not all of them are Russell Crowe, okay? A great amount of gladiators were criminals who were forced to fight each other in the name of entertainment. These prisoners of war were not really on board with fighting a lion with a dagger. They understood that this was probably a one-way trip, so many of them took their own lives before the combat even began. This one story is haunting, but it makes total sense. 29 prisoners were all set to fight these crazy animal battles in front of thousands, but they all ended up strangling each other. They took each other's lives because that was easier to them than walking into this night Nightmare. That's horrible. The reason this was an easier choice to make was because saying no would lead to an even more painful and still public execution. Number six, aphrodisiac. The fanaticism around gladiator warriors was like the fanfare around the Beatles, the Stones, and Justin Bieber, like all around, all combined. You might even argue that they were some of the very first celebrities and that was mostly due to their sex appeal. They were sex bombs, ooh ooh, beefy men. 
Yeah. Roman women believed that even their sweat was an aphrodisiac, like Old Spice deodorant. The gladiators won massive fame and even had their own action figures as children would make their clay dolls emanating their favorites. Their image would be placed on walls in public spaces and even endorsed products. Women wore hair jewelry dipped in gladiator blood or mixed their sweat into hair cream or cosmetics. To have a dream about one was said to foretell a fortunate marriage. There was even graffiti in Pompeii that depicted one fighter who would catch women in his nets at night. Like a sexy boogeyman. Ooh. Number five, loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and Egyptian times, here we go, two for one. The loincloth was of course used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step by step on how to make your own loincloth and I tried it and it's way more complicated than I could have ever imagined, okay? We don't have a lot of archaeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, obviously. There's not a lot of bones in them that would hang out over these thousands of years. But ancient Romans would often use leather to make underwear. Can you imagine that? Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the sun? Oh, I need baby powder, just thinking about it right now. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments and you know, zippers and stuff, but that's that's for another video. We'll get to that another time. Number four, cesspools. Hey, here's a note. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where not to build certain rooms. In case you're building a castle, anyone watching? Like say over a cesspool, as an example. Yeah, don't build anything heavy over here or else Let's talk about it. Cesspools were often placed under floors, which makes sense, because you know, gravity and life and stuff. But you need to make sure those floors are supportive enough, period, that's it. Or else, this will happen. Back in 1183, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire had a dinner in the palace of Erfurt. But in the main floor of the main hall, broke open, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through said floor, with even a few drowning again in said cesspool. Yeah, it's a horrible way to go. And then again, in 1326 in England, Richard the Raker had just sat down. The guy hasn't even started his meal yet, and then again, the floor beneath him broke and he fell through and drowned in a cesspool. That's like the worst way to drown too. I'd say chamber pots were safer, but when it comes to waste, out of sight, out of mind, sadly, just get that shit away from me, just downhill, Get it out, or else we'll drown in it, probably. Number three, Roman shampoo. Okay, when my hair grew out over the pandemic, I had a panic attack. I've never, I don't know what the f to do. I had a huge wake-up call. I've never had long hair before. I don't know what to use in this mop. I still don't, clearly, evidently. All I had growing up was the classic four-in-one shampoo for guys. That wasn't working out at all, that sucked. I needed some curl cream, okay, separate jars of items, not just a five in one with mouthwash on your head. That's, those aren't, those aren't good. Those don't do anyone any good. But the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders back then. What did they do? Well, sometimes nothing. They would dip their hair in cold water and at public bathhouses also, very public. Then they would rub and scrape away oils. Lime water was also used to wash your hair, but that was just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all to clean their head. They would rub their head with bran, like just a loose bran, before bed, and then they'd brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. I thought that was bad. Bran? <laughs> Be so itchy, I wouldn't sleep a wink. Number two, ancient socks. Somebody got me socks over the holidays as a gift, and let me tell you, last year, I became a man. I was like, thank you, I actually love this. This is now the best gift of my life. Socks and lip balm? That's it, I don't want a PlayStation, get lost. Socks in ancient Greece, first of all, they weren't, you know, the ankle socks, there weren't Vans skateboarding socks, there weren't the weird grippy ones that kids have. Where were those growing up, first of all? Not even close. Socks came around in the eighth century BC and it was made fresh from animal hairs. This led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then, you know, tying it more and more and more and higher and higher. Anything to keep it there. Now cut to the second century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game finally got real. Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins. It was now softer, it was lighter, and then later in the fifth century, socks were worn only by the most holy, which is kind of ironic because socks have holes in them. You get the joke, there it is. Socks were associated with the church. They were considered a symbol of purity. Socks would go all the way up your leg back then. Like I said, a little different than the uh, New Balance ankle socks we got today. A little less holy. Finally, number one, public bathhouse. This last one, okay, we haven't moved on from this at all. That's why I wanted to finish this list. Nice little fresh fun reminder from Taylor McWaters. Here we go. We still bathe together a lot. We go to water parks and we swim around in pools filled with pee. Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, slightly yuckier versions of water parks. They would literally spread intestinal parasites. They were actually way worse. And these massive rooms with giant pools just lie disease, nude, there were and everyone was sweaty and it was all tight and there was no filtration system. It was like an indoor hot tub without the pumps or the salts, it was gross. The Romans were literally figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I of course mentioned earlier, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. Yeah, my above ground pool wasn't heated, but the ancient Romans, they had heated pools, 
Great, I'm gonna send an email to my dad this afternoon. Now I'm pissed. The archaeology and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Yeah, the fossilized feces showed that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses nearby were all but yeah, they were horrible. They were just spreading hot disease, coming in hot. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans. To be fair, they also brought with them lice and fleas. Ayo, this one for the road. At number 10, population. It's pretty messed up just how many slaves there were in ancient Rome. In their society, wealthy people owned dozens, if not hundreds of slaves to do their menial work. In ancient Rome, anyone could be sold into slavery. No matter your race or background, if you could work, you could be bought and sold. Historians believe that about 90% of the free people in Italy by the first century BCE had ancestors who were slaves. At one point, the Roman Senate debated having slaves wear uniforms to be able to distinguish them from the rest of society, but they ultimately decided against it when they realized just how many slaves there were. One ancient Roman politician once said, quote, It was once proposed in the Senate that slaves should be distinguished from free people by their dress. But then it was realized how great and danger this would be if our slaves began to count us. End quote. They literally couldn't afford to let the slaves know how many other slaves there were because if they would have known they outnumbered the other members of society, this could have led to a revolt. I mean, there were slave revolts regardless, but we will get to that later. At number nine, lifestyle. Ancient Roman slaves experienced different lifestyles and living conditions based on a number of factors, often linked to their occupations. Slaves who didn't have a specific skill or trade were often used in mines and agriculture, and those were the harshest conditions that they could have been subjected to. Oftentimes, they were literally worked to death, and since they didn't have any human rights in the eyes of the Romans, they were often overlooked and simply replaced. On the other hand, household slaves received more humane treatment. They were treated better by their masters, and sometimes they were able to get some money in order to buy their freedom. If they were able to buy their freedom, the slaves would become freedmen, which was a social class between slaves and free people. Before we continue discussing the hard lives of slaves in ancient Rome, make sure you guys smash that thumbs up button if you're thoroughly entertained so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Spartacus. At one point, a group of Roman slaves revolted, and though they eventually lost lost their battle, they survived a pretty long time thanks to one famous slave named Spartacus. Spartacus was a slave who escaped a gladiatorial training camp and recruited thousands of other slaves to fight for their freedom alongside him. For the slaves, Spartacus was their symbol of hope and their leader. This slave army was able to defy Roman authorities for two years with freedom in their sights, but unfortunately those dreams were crushed when Roman general Crassus crushed Spartacus and his army. After Spartacus was killed, the authorities came for the rest of the slaves in the army and they were severely punished. 6,000 slaves who took part in the revolt were crucified, and this was almost a warning to the other slaves against trying to revolt again. Spartacus became a legend, but it wasn't enough to free the Roman slaves. At number 7, Ownership In ancient Rome, slavery and slave ownership was such a common practice that pretty much everyone owned slaves, regardless of social status. Even some of the poorest Roman citizens would own one or two slaves. Obviously, the more money you had back then, the more slaves you could afford. In Roman Egypt, the average artisan owned about two or three slaves each. Emperor Nero was known to have owned over 400 slaves who lived and worked in his home in the city, but his numbers are eclipsed by a wealthy Roman named Gaius Caecilius Isidorus, who according to historical records owned 4,166 slaves at the time of his death. That just gives you an idea of just how many people were sold into slavery in the first place. At number 6, freedom. Earlier I mentioned that Roman slaves had the chance to buy their freedom. It was a lengthy process, but this gave a lot of slaves hope for a better life. Things weren't always better after buying their freedom though, and many of them sold themselves back into slavery because things were tough. The process of buying your freedom as a slave was called manumission. This could be achieved in a number of ways. Slave master could grant their slave freedom as a reward for their service and loyalty. The slave could pay their master a sum of money to be freed, or sometimes a slave master could just find it convenient to let their slave go. Most slave masters who chose that last option to free their slave for their own benefit were merchants who needed someone to be able to sign contracts on their behalf, and since slaves weren't allowed to represent their masters from a legal standpoint, they would be freed, but would still work for their master. You also had to be over the age of 30 to buy your freedom, so if you were lucky to live that long, then there was hope of being freed, but with the average life expectancy in ancient Rome being about 28 years or so, and with the living conditions of many slaves, they would be lucky to get that opportunity. Number 5 is the warrior diet. When the remains of 67 gladiators predicted to be over 2,000 years old were researched, modern day science allowed for a reconstruction 
version of what these mighty men were eating. It was discovered that they ate a plant-based carb-rich diet that included barley and beans, but very little animal protein. Essentially, they were vegetarians. For how hard these men were worked and trained, this diet was not meant to be filling. More pragmatic reasons, as simple carbs can boost subcutaneous fat and increase survival in battle. Because of this fatty cushioning, the blood vessels and nerves were better protected when they were cut in fights, as blood clots significantly faster. Another reason for this diet was that it was cheap when you had a lot of mouths to feed. Oftentimes, food was already something gladiators had held over their heads as a motivational drive. Gladiators also consumed some more other questionable things, such as each other's blood or uh, drinking cupfuls of water mixed with ash as the perfect remedy for abdominal cramps and bruises. I guess if they're hangry, they're going to be more efficient in the arena. Gladiators weren't the only hungry animals in the arena, however. Number four in our countdown is Battle of Beast. Animals were seen in the arena for the purpose of killing or being killed. It said around a million animals died in a sport called Venatio over the 390 years that the Roman amphitheater was active. Venatio was hunting and killing of wild animals and would often take place in the morning ahead of a gladiator's battle that would be happening in the afternoon. Animals used in the games were considered to be extremely exotic at the time as a display of wealth of the empire. Some of these examples are deer, rabbits, crocodiles, and elephants, and then the better known examples of leopards, bears, tigers, boars, and lions. While the goal of Venatio was for the animals to be the victim of the trained gladiator referred to as a venator, sometimes they simply overpowered their opponent and won in the arena, in which case, like a gladiator, the crowd would celebrate the animal's glory. Animals were also used in ad bestias, a form of execution for lower class. A prisoner or multiple would be let loose in the arena with wild animals for the crowd's delight. Sometimes traps or weapons were laid out to draw out the spectacle. Even after Emperor Constantine outlawed gladiatorial fights in the year 325, gory animal entertainment continued for another 300 years. Don't be misguided, however, the Romans knew how to have a bloodbath just about anywhere, so Rock the Boat is number three in our countdown. Called Nachia, this event was a naval battle staged by the emperors using real ships in large Roman channels or even artificial lakes. Considered the most spectacular of blood sport, this wasn't like regular gladiatory battles taking place regularly. This was reserved for high honors or special occasions. The Roman Colosseum is known to have held two near the date of its inauguration. One Namachia took place in the commemoration of Julius Caesar's triumph in 46 BC. No surprise, as Julius was actually the inventor of this blood sport. Participants were low status gladiators, prisoners of war, or criminals condemned to death, rather than any appreciated gladiators, as the battles were much bloodier and fatality being the goal made death inescapable. And that's not what the gladiators were about, so it was said as many as 2,000 prisoners would be boarded onto the ships to fight amongst each other while civilians watch from a safe distance. And boy, did civilians come. People came from all around to see, and it's recorded that some were trampled to death in the process. Others camped out overnight in order to get a seat, like it was an Ed Sheeran concert. Like festivals or fireworks, a mini industry would set up around the Laker Amphitheater. Bars, street vendors, and prostitutes would come into the area in order to capitalize on these events. Unlike a letter from Hogwarts, this is not the type of school you're excited to attend. Number two is Gladiator School. You only got into this school one of two ways. Slave purchase or volunteering, which by the way would be insane as gladiator schools were incredibly strict and the training they provided was harsh. With some archaeological evidence showing that gladiators could be killed as punishment for just misbehaviors. This is because upon entering gladiator school, those who had not been condemned to it as a punishment for a crime sign a contract stipulating the type of combatant that they would become, how many times a year they would fight, and sign themselves over into the property of their master. Seeing as there was different kinds of gladiators, men were sorted into categories based on height and body, where they would train under a madristi, or a gladiator trainer, who were former gladiators themselves and would pass on the skills they learned in the arena to the new generation of fighters. As we know, food was sparse and purely fueled, the rest of the environment reflects that ideal, with gladiators living in cells and only leaving them to train or battle. If there were any luxuries in gladiators training schools, they were only there to protect the slave owners' investments in their gladiators. Archaeologists have found many schools equipped with heated floors and reliable hot water, as well as infirmaries and graveyards. After the rebellion of Spartacus and his fellow gladiators around 73 BC, these schools were no longer privately owned, and the state took a much closer interest in how they were run, ensuring that gladiators they trained wouldn't use their specialist fighting skills against Rome itself again. Finally, at number one in our countdown, the break for freedom. You've been kept in a dirty cell, forced to battle and train on repeat, fed mushy barley, something's gotta give. How do you get out? We know you can't exactly fake your death. Well, unfortunately, unless he performs 
performed exceptionally well in the arena, a gladiator was unlikely to be made a free man after just one glory. It's reported that most gladiators needed to fight and win about 15 times before seeing freedom from slavery. Since a sole gladiator fought an average of three to six times a year, this was a long time. And since one fifth of all fights ended in one of the combatants dying, the odds of making it to freedom were pretty low. However, some gladiators had no interest in leaving. One example is celebrated fighter Flama, who rejected his offered freedom on four separate occasions. He carried on and in total fought an amazing 34 times, winning 21 of his contests and drawing in nine of them before dying in an arena in Sicily. One of Rome's most famous gladiator battles documented was a tiebreaker. Priscus and Versus were two of the best gladiators of the first century, so obviously they had him face off. A poet named Marshall documented both men being a perfect match of skill and bravery, fighting for hours until ironically submitting to one another at the same time. The crowd exploded at the scene and shocked Emperor Titus declared that they had both won and gave them the ultimate prize. Freedom, symbolized by a rudis, a wooden sword that both men would have used when they started their gladiator training. These examples were lucky and skilled men, however, as most gladiators did not ever survive to see freedom, especially those who earned their career as a punishment for being a criminal. Simply put, the most disturbing part of being a Roman gladiator is you never truly got to stop. All right, I want to start small and warm us up, so let's meet the turncoat Arminius. Unbeknownst to the Romans, their one time barbarian ally, the Germanic chieftain, had a change of heart on the 9th of September, 9 CE, and decided it would be kind of silly and fun, you know, to lure 36,000 Roman soldiers to their death. The deadly ambush was set up in the Titoburg forest where the friend of Arminius, Publius Varius, was leading the troops. When they were pounced upon, as many as 20,000 Roman troops are cut down in the carnage. Varius was horrified by the betrayal. He had just defended this man to the Roman courts only weeks prior due to suspicions of a coup being somewhere in the kingdom. Now he saw the the consequences of his actions, and it was the chopped up mincemeat that was once his army. So Varius threw himself on his sword. This was a bad time for Emperor Augustus already, so this is notoriously the story of him getting told the news and it making him bang his head repeatedly into a marble column while crying to Varius' dead ghost to give him back his legions. Dude was in his 70s and running the Roman Empire was stressful, no doubt. Tiptoeing up the escalation stairs, we'll do Marcus Manlius next. Hear that? Manly is in the literal middle name. Now I know it's his last name, but just let me have that, okay? So this is the second known case of Berdulio, Berdulio, a type of top-notch extremist level bat betrayal charge, and it was a good old Marcus that was slapped with that title. Manlius was a celebrity as of like 390 or 387 BCE, since he defended the Capitoline Hill against a band of Celts that had annihilated a Roman army and captured the city itself. A few years later, he became the champion of the common people because he was anti-debt and anti-debt bonded, which would definitely make the notables hate him, especially the Roman establishment. Manlius is seen as a threat and subsequently accused of aspiring a regnum. One of the traditions mentioned by Livius, he was condemned by the Dumviri and thrown from the Tarpinian Rock. This was a fat spit in the face to the former hero, seeing as the Tarpinian Rock is part of the Capitoline Hill, which Manlius had defended so courageously for the same twist of being tossed off of it. There's a lot of cool names on this list, but I I'd say this one is pretty up there. It's Furious Prosimius. According to Pliny the Elder, in ancient times, jealousy, bitterness, and disbelief towards other people were at 100% visibility if they achieved even bare minimum success. Gaius Furious Criminius, a farmer from Italy, is a literal court documented case of this. He was just really good at gardening and farming, just a total green thumb type, and he worked hard and he was organized. He had well groomed animals and servants and was able to achieve really large crops, which the neighbors were jealous of, especially because he'd just moved in and they had the head start. How was he doing this? Well, if you got a small brain and no logic, you're gonna assume witchcraft. His neighbors gaggle together and sue him for magically poisoning their crops during the night. The Roman magistracy is then prosecuting him under the provision in the law of the 12 tables, which punished by death or the loss of citizenship if anyone is convicted of using magic to take away the fertility of someone else's soil. It is the only known trial where this law played a role. On the day of court, Criminius cruised in the city before the Karul Adil and peeved neighbors, loaded down with his farming tools in excellent condition and healthy, content, well-fed animals and servants. Since he was visibly just harder working, he just won, like 
that and as neighbors learn something about the grass will always be greener on the other side. Let's meet the multi-charged Messalina because she is the first recorded woman in the Julio-Claudian period of Rome to have multiple criminal charges because if we're being real, women usually get executed on their first criminal charge. So makes sense she's one of the only. Emperor Claudius's third wife, she had a keen understanding of power politics and her means of exercising power in politics circles was through criminal law and not even a little. Like by 689, she even had her own regular prosecutor, P. Silius Rufus, whose services she was widely known to have employed, aka Messalina's a Karen. And she's a true historical reminder why no matter how great a man Claudius was, especially in law and leadership, he had one weak spot. Absolutely bat crap crazy women who would train wreck or bang just about anything. So let's run through some of Messalina's track record, shall we? So Messalina versus Julia Livilia in AD 41. Political accusations under the motive of Messalina's jealousy that secured the banishment and subsequent death of her husband's niece, Julia, all because she didn't pay honor to Messalina or flatter her, and she was extremely beautiful. A year later, Messalina versus Appius Silanus, who is her literal stepdad, and it ends in his death. Why? Because she threw herself at him and he rejected her advances, so she told a soldier to tell Claudius that the soldier had a dream Silanus would kill Claudius. Dreams come true, so Claudius had Silanus smoke. Year after that, it's versus Canonius Justice, because the prefect had witnessed Messalina forcing moral degradation by making women commit adultery in the imperial palace while husbands were present, an act of humiliation and shame for all victims involved. Prefect Catatonius was going to snitch to the emperor about his wife's wild hobbies, but before he could, she had him charged with an undocumented crime that had him put to death. Honestly, I could keep going with Messalina, she's got quite the rap sheet, but we got bigger and better to move on to. Like next up is the rescue of Sextus. The Roman names, man, they really go hard. So Sextus Roscius was a farmer in 80 BC. His dad was killed in the streets of Rome, with no witnesses. When Sextus is boo-hooing, almost the second his daddy is killed, their family estates were illegally added to the year past submission end dates for the prescription auctions by Lucius Cornelius Chrysogothenus, powerful freedom men of the dictator Sulla, the same man who buys the estates worth millions for meager pennies from the auction. That's right, y'all, we got an ancient Roman scammer. So Lucius then conspired with two relatives of the deceased named Titus and Titus, no, not a joke, to accuse the young Sextus of his father's murder. The case was so simple for the prosecution as obviously Sextus had the most to gain from his father's death and hired someone to do the deed. Meanwhile, the Roman courtroom bad boy Cicero picks up Sextus's defense and turned the whole trial around in his first ever major litigation by simply explaining the exact series of events I explained to you. Conspiracy, auction, scam, etc. Cicero argued that those who chose to align themselves with Lucius in the belief that they were supporting the nobility were wrong to do so. Since his corruption was a stain on the Republic, his defense was a swinging success and Stexus the Young is acquitted and his land returned. Number five. So it's a big old procession and the most important part of the wedding day, signifying a public acknowledgement of the wedding. The procession could begin at the bride's family's hearth with a ritual where she would be pulled from her mother's arms and a demonstration of the bride's modesty and sadness of leaving the family home. The entire procession then paraded to the groom's house and the bride specifically was escorted by three younger men, one carrying a torch and the other two would be holding her arms. They are followed by the pronuba, five white pine torches that are carried to honor Cerces, an earth fertility goddess. The bride then has a bouquet of distaffs or spindles to nod to her duty as a wool maker for the family. Then would come the couple's friends and family behind them. Anyone else could join the procession, and many people did just for fun, all while throwing candied nuts at the bride. The groom received the bride at the door, which she entered with the distaff and spindle in hand. And at the threshold, the bride adorned the doorway post with the fat of a pig to honor Cerces, the fat of a wolf to honor Rome, and then remember those raw wool strips all up in her hair? They get added to the door too. After she's finished her arts and craft project, the husband would present her the household keys. In pagan times, she'd do a consent chant. Then he'd sweep her up and carry her in the doorway since tripping was a bad omen. Guests were invited in for a meal and only left when it was time to undo Hercules knot. Like levels in a video game, now outside the bedroom door, the groom presents the bride fire and water, the elements of the household maintenance. The bride touches each and then her husband would undo the knot, even if fortification wasn't to occur and just like that, you're married. And you may be wondering how to 
congratulate the happy couple? Well, don't worry, because that's number four in the countdown. So, as mentioned, if you're hanging around in a procession, whether part of the wedding party or just an everyday Joe, you get to hug handfuls of dried candied fruits and nuts at the bride. Walnuts were most popular for this, which I feel would be the worst kind of nut to get stuck in your hair, but maybe getting a dried apricot thrown at you and bouncing off your cranium isn't much better either. As I'm sure you can tell, this was the cultural precursor to throwing rice, confetti, and bits of paper, which probably resulted in fewer brides with eye injuries. As an attendee, you can yell feliciter, which means good luck, or talisio, which even in the times of the late republic was an archaic word. There were most definitely obscene songs. Naturally, they were sung by men and children in the procession on my personal favorite, this little hand sign. This is Manofico, representing good luck, fertility, protection from the evil eye. However, in modern Italian culture, it's evolved into an intercourse-based insult, so don't go busting it out at weddings. Now here's a question I've heard a few times, and I love answering stuff. So, who can marry who is number three. If you went back in time and asked a Roman their perspective on interracial marriage, they'd be so confused by your question, they'd probably miss the fact that you're wearing Air Maxes. Fun fact, kids, but most of those ancient worlds didn't have a racial categories. A Briton and a Syrian? African and Romanian? Caribbean and Native American? What's Latin for whatever's yo? Because they didn't regard such things as fundamentally wrong the way that modern crappy people can. The evidence seems to show that ethnicity played a little part once a group was Romanized. If they acted, dressed, and behaved as a Roman, then to most, they were a real Roman. That meant you could marry another Roman. Don't even ask me about same-sex relationships because those were laughably normal. But hear what I mentioned, Roman and Roman. That's because the big Roman taboo was class mixing. A great example is how a barbarian and a Roman citizen couldn't marry, not on the grounds of race mixing or same genders, but actually on pure legality. Marriage had to be between two Roman Empire citizens. Barbarians, who were anyone living in the regions around Rome but not part of the Roman Empire, did not have conubium, which is aka the right to specifically marry Roman citizens. This applied to even the Greeks, who were held above the other barbarians for being similar enough to the Romans. If a marriage between a Germanic and a Roman tried or did successfully happen, man, y'all could be beige, pink, black, green, blue, boys, girls, all in between. It's a scandal. One that could be subjected to a court case or even a death sentence. Let's talk about number two, the Roman divorce. Prior to the late Republic, divorce was virtually unknown. Changes in marriage laws allowed for women to keep control of her dowry, and this made divorce and self-sustenance more viable option for women. And it was also simple, just so simple. Just as a marriage was only a declaration of intent to live together, as mentioned, really all that's necessary is a procession to the groom's house, divorce was just a declaration of the couple's intent not to live together. All that law required was that they declare their wish to divorce before seven witnesses. An ex-wife could expect to receive her dowry back in full and then return to her father's possession. If she'd been independent before the wedding, i.e. orphan freed woman, she would regain her independence. Under the Lex Julia, founded by Augustus, a wife found guilty of adultery in special court might sacrifice the return of half her dowry and it allowed her dad to kill her, or just about any man, really creepy. Divorce for infertility, always assumed to be the woman's fault, was valid given that bearing children was pretty much the point of the marriage thing, and also political advancement was another valid reason for divorce. In the late Republic, Cato the Younger divorced his wife Marcia so that she could marry someone else and he could forge links with the orator Quintus Horentius, the only way he could climb in rank. Cato loved Marcia and missed her deeply, so when Horentius dies a few years later, Cato was now a high ranking man and remarried his now very rich ex-wife. The last and the craziest on the list is number one. Where did it all come from? All these traditions, all these centuries. Roman weddings have had some of the most influence on traditions we still have today. Even the language, like tying the knot. But I have to come to bear some horrible, horrible origins for all of these traditions. The taking of Sabine women. The story is set when the village of Rome was first established in 753 BCE. Its population was almost entirely men, with only a small handful of already married women who are now too scared to leave their home. So, what's the answer to prehistoric evil men? Steal women of childbearing age from the neighboring township of Sabine. These girls are then forced into marriages through physicality. So when their fathers and brothers and previous husbands come to wage war and retrieve their women, the women are now mothers and throw themselves between the evil men who are now the fathers of their children and then the men who they've been stolen from, their family. Historians say this is because women supposedly felt so much guilt over the bloodshed that started in their names. They wanted to live neither fatherless nor with Widowed. So a truce is called, and the Sabines and the Romans unite their community. There's a lot to be said here about motives for consent, notions of honor and family, female trauma, and the history being very obviously written by a man. So for now, let's focus on the fact that many Roman weddings 
refer to this legendary empire shaping event. The hairstyle of six braids, it's parted with a spearhead to represent the violent capture of the Sabines, pulling the daughter from her mother's arms, and her family taking her away in a procession to her new husband's home. Women carried across the threshold to avoid tripping a bad omen. It's a reference to Sabine women being forcibly carried or dragged into their captors' homes. Plutarch gave more explanation to the meaning of that wedding word, Talisio, including the fact that it's named on one of the Sabine abductors and wool related. Thus all the wool necessary in the wedding and the scraps being left around his front door. All of these traditions are incorporated into ancient Roman weddings after the atrocity united communities to try and ritualize the event that joined the two nations and create a bond from it, rewriting the tragedy into unity and celebration. And now we still do some of these things today. Number 10, sacred books. The Romans paved the way for many following civilizations. Okay, they invented surgical tools, they invented medicine on the battlefield, and before this era, literature took the form of a tablet or a scroll. The Romans, they created the codex. Pages stacked on top of one another, just bound pages. The reason you have homework right now to be doing instead of watching this. It's all thanks to the ancient Romans. The early codex was bound wax, and then it moved to animal skin. This was a big step because early Christians used this new invention to produce copies of the Bible. Important pieces of history, so rightfully so, they had to be locked away from the public. Now back when King Tarkin ruled Rome, a local woman offered the Etruscan king nine books. Now these books were ignored at first, but upon its second glance, the beat up manuscripts foretold the rise and fall of Rome. So for most of its time, these spoiler filled manuscripts were held in the temple of Jupiter. So if anybody wants to do National Treasure 3, I have some ideas, just saying. We could do like nine installments. And number nine, corrupt fire department. Oh, here we go. When we think back to ancient times, it's not long before we come across an ancient blaze or some ancient wild tragedy where you're like, oh my God, how did that even happen? Something that reminds you that it wasn't always a party, okay? It was rarely a party, in fact. When we think of Julius Caesar when regarding the leadership of Rome, we often forget Marcus Crossus. He was powerful and full of bright ideas on the sidelines. Marcus ran the fire brigade. A lot of open fires, a lot of accidents happened at this time, so of course we need responders. But back then, these officials arrived on site to this blazing emergency, but before helping out, Crossus would demand the owner sells their property to him first. Yeah, watch it burn or sell it for a not so handsome price. The choice is yours. And also you have 38 seconds to decide. TikTok. Number eight, ancient drag. I'll respect a girl's night out, okay? Always, I get it. My guy friends have ruined most nights out that I've had in the city, because guys are dumb asses. That's a fact. Ancient Romans were ahead of the game with this one as well. That's why they made the festival of the good goddess women only. Yeah, statues of men weren't even allowed to partake. Statues depicting men at this festival had to be draped. Yeah, none of us were seeing anything. But then in comes Mr. Jealous, Mr. Ancient FOMO himself. Enter Publius Clodius Pulcher, okay? This man disguised himself as a flute lady, but when he didn't play the flute, and also wasn't a lady, and also nobody knew him, it was a little obvious that an intruder was present. A trial soon followed and the festival was then suspended. See, guys ruin the party, even in ancient Roman days. This dude's like, nah, I'm gonna go ruin it. Number seven, sewer goddess. I love reading about ancient gods. It's my favorite topic. The Roman god of manure and fertilizer, for example. Where was that one in Hades? That would have been helpful. I would have beat that game in eight minutes flat with him. The god of toilets. There's one we can't forget about either. Crepitus, okay? Every day we have to thank the god of toilets, right? If you haven't today, Go ahead and thank them. The Romans regarded Glossina as the goddess of the main drain. The literal main drain to the city of Rome. All this water. This goddess was Gloca Maximum, aka Big Drain. Eventually this god was affiliated with Venus, the goddess of beauty and love. Yeah, love me some big ass drains. Nice. That's a lie actually. As a kid I was so afraid of the bathtub drain. I'd pull it and then just immediately high jump out of the tub. I don't want to get sucked down like Ant-Man. Know what I mean? Number six, death before combat. With most of these Roman gladiators, they're trained, they understand a specific style of combat, and they're paired with an opponent that's somewhat equal. And then hundreds of people go, yeah, and they bet on you, and then see you blood and stuff. It's horrible. But not all these gladiators are UFC fighters, okay? Not all of them are Kurt Russell and handsome. No, a great amount of these gladiators were criminals who were forced to fight each other in the name of entertainment, or they were slaves. Yeah, these prisoners of war were not really on board with fighting a lion with a dagger, believe it or not. They understood this was a one-way trip, most likely, so many of them took their own lives before the combat even begun. This one story is quite haunting, but it makes total sense, sadly. 29 prisoners, they were all set to fight these crazy animal battles in front of thousands, but they all strangled each other. They all took each other's lives with their bare hands because that was easier to them than walking into this nightmare 
designer publicly. That's horrible. The reason this was the easier choice to make, sadly, was because saying no to the combat or to the games would just lead to an even more painful public execution. So it's a lose-lose, sadly. They sucked. Number five, blindfolded. Remember that last scene in the movie Dodgeball when Vince Vaughn blindfolds himself and then still wins somehow? What a moment in time. There were no dry eyes in the entire theater. But what if I told you gladiators would also pull this trick off? Yeah, in order to get crowds to return for these massive death events, they would need to change the formula up from time to time. Sometimes they would have cheap beer nights, which helped, but a new idea that worked was referred to as andabada, where gladiators wore blindfolds during combat. They would also leave the armor inside. Yeah, sometimes just battling in sandals and cloth. And you thought Marco Polo made you anxious? Mm. They would save these events for the more brutal criminals, so people weren't just forced to, you know, wrap up their eyes and shake their legs into an arena. It was, you know, they were bad, so it's kind of like, mm, it was fine, I guess. Number four, women fought as gladiators. This was news to me. I wouldn't do it because tiny. Uh, as we might have already established, gladiators were usually built from slaves, warriors, and sometimes even volunteers. Good for you. And apparently women were not exempt from that. Female slaves were quite frequently condemned to face their fate in the arena, though some volunteered because, you know, they were Xena warriors. Some of the time it was as genuine contenders, while some were sent simply for the entertainment or embarrassment. Emperor Dominion, for example, loved to pit women against people with dwarfism because he thought it was funny. Neither the women or the little people were taken seriously, as few appeared to have proven themselves in combat. However, some still did, rest assured. The timeline as to when they started doing this is unclear, but there are records of at least two women referred to as Amazon and Achillea. Epic names, right? Whoa. They are depicted on a marble relief dating back to the second century AD, and it says that they fought in an honorable draw. Women also joined in the animal hunts, but by 200 AD, their participation ended when Emperor Septimus Severus banned them in the games. Damn you, Severus Snape. Number three, nets for weapons. When you're walking into that arena, you're eyeing down this eight foot six beast in front of you. He has like 12 abs. It doesn't look good. His name's Gore or something terrifying. You're gonna want a nerf bat or two. You're gonna want a weapon. Now, weapons in the Colosseum were a necessity, of course, but can you believe some gladiators would use nets to fight? Nets. Oh. Yes. Yeah, nets, like they're catching butterflies or co-hosts. This class was referred to as the Ritari. Now their combat style was built around the ways of fishermen. Yeah, Popeye versus Maximus, place your bets, people. Realistically, these warriors looked a lot more like Aquaman. They would fight with a trident and a net. They would take their time. They would avoid these mighty swings from these big dudes. And then when the time was right, they would just go Zzz! and then they would just poke the shit out of them with a trident over and over in hopes that it would, you know, end. It helps to be quick, but if you've seen Game of Thrones, you know that spears don't always work. Number two, are you not entertained? Great title, I know. Fun fact, gladiators for the most part didn't actually try and kill each other in the ring, just like wound. Yeah, take a second to digest that beside the Hollywood movies you know and love. But the truth was gladiators had a code they had to follow and killing each other wasn't a part of it. Why? Well, because gladiators were expensive investments and seeing your prize fighter that you've like forked hundreds and thousands of dollars into die in a fight would hurt your wallet big time. Also, most of them knew each other and were besties, so they didn't even want to. Contests were usually single combat between two even opponents and referees oversaw the whole thing. If one got injured enough, the ref would probably just, you know, call it. Often enough, the bout would end after both participants gave an entertaining show and would leave with honor. They were like, yeah, you're entertained. Good, we're gonna go, right? Cool. However, their life expectancy was still short. Historians estimate that gladiators had one in five or one in 10 chance of ending up dead after the bout, either from being killed or wounded, gangrene, you know the whole deal. And finally, coming in at number one spot, naval battles. Okay, so I mentioned the Aquaman gladiators with the nets and the, you know, pokey poke tridents. That's absolutely insane. But have you heard about the staged naval battles? What a spectacle this would have been. The Colosseum was once flooded, which I'm sure took a hot minute or two. 
Then these ships would come out and then it would be like medieval times, but with a splash zone, right? These ships were designed to resemble these vessels from famous battles, but the bottom of the ship was flat because the water was only five feet deep. Can't have the bottom of the ship scraping against all that sand and bones and stuff. No, you'll get stuck. The water was only five feet deep, so obviously they couldn't use real ships. It wasn't always violent reenactments either. Sometimes they would fill the Colosseum and nude synchronized swimmers would come out. Nice, nothing like an in-ground pool filled with gladiator bones. Also, goggles weren't invented until the 14th century, so yuck. These naval battles were doing so well that Emperor Domitian devoted an entire lake to them. It's kind of like Harry Potter Goblet of Fire. They would just go to this lake and then watch these insane battles or performances, you know? Hashtags. Slytherin, I don't know. Once the shows moved over there permanently, they then used the floodgates and trap doors to hide animals inside of. What a nice upgrade, what a show. Also, this is terrifying. Well, number 10 in our countdown, you were probably property. Gladiators were war prisoners, arrested criminals, or slaves of wealthy upperclassmen who had been sold in Rome's lucrative slave market. When the Monera gladiator battles first began, it was only slaves or criminals fighting against one another for a full year. No one actually died in gladiator battles under the law of Emperor Nero. However, we know from media that that didn't last, and gladiator battles became a widespread and gory form of entertainment. However, a common misconception is that gladiators always fought to the death. In reality, as time went on and the Monera games became a lot more controlled of a spectacle that raked in a lot of cash, the wealthy cultivated gladiators and trained them. They invested in them, so it would be an economic blow to have their warriors die. So gladiator games, while bloody, had more of the intent to maim rather than downright slaughter. However, you always did as you were told, so sometimes the hand was forced. At a time when three in every five persons did not survive survive until their 20th birthday, the odds of a professional gladiator being killed even accidentally during the first century AD was perhaps 1 in 10. With this evolution and growing celebrity of gladiators came free men volunteering to be gladiators. They signed on for a fee and swore a fearful oath of absolute submission to the Lentista to be burned, flogged, beaten, or killed if so ordered. In fact, it was estimated that more than 20% of the trainee gladiators who attended the Ludi Gladiatori, or gladiator school, were free men from Roman society and also composed most of the gladiator population by the end of the Roman Republic. But no matter how idolized a gladiator became in Roman society, he never rose above the social status of a prostitute. Number nine in our countdown is the contradictory sexualization. Gladiators had their names painted on street walls, monuments erected, and even properties built in their names and images. So isn't it a little strange that despite all of this, the second a gladiator was out of the ring, Roman people would look down upon him? Well, since they were usually criminals or slaves, this was the case. The term gladiator was even used derogatorily at the time. That didn't stop their wealthy masters from taking advantage of the endless lust directed towards the men. Gladiators had such an effect on women that the first term for fangirl was invented in this time. Graffiti was found on the walls of Pompeii, even note how one gladiator was the delight of all the girls, while another catches the girls at night in his net. The whole industry was built around sexual attractiveness of gladiators, and gladiators Gladiator merchandise was popular as a result, especially amongst Roman women. For example, flakes of gladiator skin, bottles of their sweat, and ornaments colored with their blood were sold as aphrodisiacs, contraceptives, and love potions. Men, however, sought out the fighter's blood because it was believed to increase a man's sexual vigor. Speaking of blood, could you use a little to your own advantage? Before you think about it, you can't fake death comes in at number eight. It'd probably be pretty tempting when faced with clubs, roaring lions, flaming arrows, and swinging swords, you get hit hard enough and a messy gash with enough blood can make your prone body look lifeless if you lay still enough. But don't be fooled. When they drag your body out from the arena and your heart skips a beat thinking you got away easy, you've done anything but. The Romans had measures to make sure that the dead were truly dead and not faking it. After a gladiator faced his honorable death and was carried through the death gate, he was taken to a room where he was stripped of his armor before they cut his throat. Nothing to worry about if you were dead, but if any part of you was still alive, it would be bleeding out. When a less than honorable honorable gladiator was declared dead, a slave would instead come out and bash his head in with either a large rock or a club publicly. Either way, there was no way for a gladiator to escape death after he had fallen. The Romans loved their irony, and what better example than deaths at a funeral? Number seven in our countdown. How did these bloody displays even begin? Well, they were originally part of the funeral entertainment and blood rites for wealthy nobles. When distinguished aristocrats
Democrats died, their families would have two slaves or criminals throw down in a kind of macabre eulogy to honor the virtues the deceased had had. Okay, two Roman writers, Tertullian and Festus, give us some insight as to why this may be. Romans believed fresh human blood helped purify the deceased of sin. Under the reign of Julius Caesar, these games flourished. He threw a hundred man spectacles in honor of his deceased daughter and father, and by the end of the first century BC, government officials began hosting state funded games as a way of currying favor with the masses. One notable exhibition took place in 216 BCE when 22 fights were held over three days to mark the death of a prominent senator. In gladiator school, these men are taught strategy, technique, stamina, and how to die, which is number six in our countdown. It was in the ludus that the gladiators learned the rules of the arena. Above all that they were taught was that they were entertainers first and killers second. But all gladiators were instructed to accept the will of their editor, the efficient. So if the editor decreed that the gladiator be killed, they were expected to accept this by kneeling and showing their throat to their opponent to be cut. Despite their status and social standing, gladiators were expected to be noble and honorable in death. If you did indeed die well, then you would be treated with extra dignity. Your body would be removed from the arena with respect, as we discussed in number eight. So what makes a gladiator death inhonorable? First, the gladiator would have had to cry out during the fight, which is considered a sign of weakness. Should a gladiator be losing and ask for mercy from the editor and be denied, he was considered a coward who had failed to commit his life to the games. And so what do you feed a mighty warrior? Well, seeing as he was also your property, you want to get your bang for your buck. At number five, demand. In ancient Rome, there was an incredibly high demand for slaves, but since there were so many slaves in Rome, there was always work for them. Oftentimes, people sold themselves or their children into slavery in order to pay off their debts, so when it came to being bought, that came pretty easy. Other than public office, slaves were used for almost every activity in ancient Rome. The most common slave trade was mining because workers were always in demand, mostly due to the high level of danger that came with the job and the fact that many slaves were injured or died while working in the mines, and slave masters needed to keep replacing those who could no longer work. Domestic labor and farming were also high demand jobs for slaves back then. Back then, the logic behind using slave labor for these types of jobs was that, quote, free labor should be used in unhealthy places. End quote. Basically, they believed that it was better to have a slave pass away on the job than a free person because it would impact their business less. At number four, procurement. The way that slaves were acquired in ancient Rome was pretty messed up, I will say. Typically, slaves were acquired through four different ways. They would be brought in as war captives, as victims of pirate raids, by trade, or by breeding. During the early expansion of the Roman Empire, many war captives were turned into slaves. The pirates from Sicilia, located in what is now modern day Turkey, did business with the Romans and supplied them with a lot of their slaves. The pirates would bring their slaves to the island of Delos, which back then was considered considered to be the international center of slave trading. The slave trade was such a big deal back then that it has been recorded that on at least one occasion, 10,000 people were traded as slaves and shipped back to Italy in one day. This was a big business opportunity for a lot of people, but of course, no one ever considered the lives of the people they were buying and selling. At number three, fugitives. As you can imagine, life as a slave in ancient Rome or at any period of time wasn't easy. Living conditions were poor, it was dangerous, and no one should ever be treated like that or used for free labor. Many slaves have been known to escape and obviously the same went for those in ancient Rome. Slaves running away from their masters was a common thing back then, and to deal with it, slave owners would hire professional slave catchers to hunt down, capture, and return the escaped slave back to their owner. For slave owners who wanted to take matters into their own hands, they would advertise rewards for those who could return their slaves, or they would just try and locate their slave themselves. Some slave owners had ways of preventing their slaves from getting away, like using collars with instructions on where to return the escaped slave, much like a dog collar, which is just dehumanizing. At number two, revolts. In Roman times, slave revolts were pretty common. There have been a number of recorded slave revolts in Roman history. I mentioned the one that was led by Spartacus, but there's another pretty famous Roman slave revolt that was led by a man named Eunice. Eunice led a revolt that happened in Sicily from 135 to 132 BCE. It is said that Eunice believed himself to be a prophet and claimed to have several mystical visions. Eunice was able to persuade a number of other slaves to follow him when he performed a trick where sparks and flames came out of his 
mouth. They believed that he was magical and so they followed him to try and fight back against the Roman forces. Unfortunately, they were defeated but the example that they set is believed to have inspired yet another slave revolt in Sicily later in 104 to 103 BCE. And finally, at number one, totally normal. Probably the most messed up thing about life as a Roman slave was just how normal slavery was in society. I mean, the Roman people were so invested in their slaves that they continuously tried to crush their revolts and they tried everything in their power to keep them from escaping. Even the sheer number of slaves that were in their society just shows how important slavery was to them. Back then, slavery was just an unquestioned institution. For many, it was just a normal part of life, which is actually quite frightening when you think about it. There is no recorded history of Romans ever questioning slavery in their society, and all economic, legal, and social forces in Rome at this time worked hard to try and preserve slavery as part of their society. To the ancient Romans, slaves were seen as the direct opposite of free people, which they believed was a necessary balance that they needed in their society. They never completely got rid of slavery either. Though they did try and create new rules and laws to make life as a slave more bearable, they were still bought and sold into servitude and were seen as property and and lesser people. Now before I wrap things up for today, I want you guys to leave a comment down below telling me if you would ever want to go back in time and visit ancient Rome. I'm sure there was a lot in ancient Rome that people would want to see and experience for themselves, so let me know your thoughts down in the comments. Number 10 Family Feud After making countless lists about kings and queens and learning about the lengths they go to to gain power, it shouldn't come as a surprise to learn that Emperor Nero did some pretty messed up stuff to secure his position of power. Though he would later become an absolute menace to Roman society, he might have picked up this whole Whole violent seizure of power idea from his very own mother, since she pulled a stunt just to get Nero's foot in the door, so to speak. You see, Nero was never supposed to become emperor, but when Emperor Claudius married his niece, Agrippina, Nero's mother, she convinced Claudius to adopt Nero as his very own son. Which he did. Mysteriously, Claudius died shortly after all this went down, which meant that Nero was now in line to inherit the throne. Nero became emperor at 17, and in an effort to secure his place of power, he got the bright idea to eliminate anyone who might try and come for his seat of power. And so he poisoned his stepbrother and later had his mother eliminated as well because he saw how she took out Claudius and he didn't want to meet the same fate. I guess you could say that this was the beginning of the end for the people of Rome and for Nero himself. Number 9, a whole lot of money. This guy was like king, the sudden king of France, or I guess the OG because that came way later. But anyways, in the early morning of June 18th and 64 CE, a huge fire broke out and this blaze burned for 9 days, destroying 14 of Rome's districts and severely damaging 7 others. A large portion of Rome was leveled from the fire. Many citizens lost everything, but rumors started to break out that perhaps Nero was the one who started the fire in the first place. Why? Well, this rumor started after the emperor decided to build an opulent palace for himself that took up a hundred acres. Rather than use the Roman treasury to rebuild the city, he spent it on building his dream palace that he named Domus Aurea or the Golden House. This palace was so expensive to build that Nero was forced to devalue the Roman currency in order to stretch his money. This didn't really mean much to him, but for the rest of the people, this was devastating to the economy. So to explain their misfortunes that arose after the fire, they blamed the emperor, claiming that he was the one who started the blaze, therefore rumors. Historians are still uncertain if that's true or not, since at the time of the fire, Nero wasn't even in Rome, but he could have hired someone to carry out the plan. So who knows? Though we may never truly know, but honestly, I wouldn't put it past him. Before we continue talking about the things that made Emperor Nero a mess up dude, let me first take a moment to ask you guys to consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and consider subscribing to the channel to stay a part of the hive, because we'll love that. Number eight, the shaving festival. This is like totally Sweeney Todd in my head. Anyways. In many cultures, there are coming of age celebrations. There's the quinceanera, the bar mitzvah, the bat mitzvah, and plenty of others around the world. Back during the rule of Emperor Nero, he came up with his very own version of a coming of age type of celebration, and it was thrown in honor of his beard. Yes, Nero created an entire festival to honor his facial hair. This takes me right back to grade A when all the boys were like, do you see it? you see it, or like putting mascara on their mustaches? True story. In 59 CE, when Nero was 22 years old, he finally started getting enough facial hair to warrant being shaved. To honor this big event in his life, he invented Juvenalia, or the Games of Youth. This large festival was commissioned all because this guy was going to shave. Now, I'm not someone who grows facial hair like that, so I don't know if shaving your face for the first time is actually a big deal or not. Is it, Chris? Yeah. Is shaving your face for the first time a big deal? 
It can be. All right, there we go. But anyways, this Juvenilia Festival became a showcase for the performing arts. Every kind of theatrical performance was present at this festival, and Nero was known to have participated in some performances, but we'll get to that in a minute. Let's jump to the next point. Number seven, public performances. Let's talk about Emperor Nero, the actor. Nero always had a love for the arts. Many historians believe that if he never became emperor, then he would have become a performer. And some even think his dead dream of becoming a performer is what may have fueled his tyranny in the first place. He wanted his Oscar moment so bad, more than Leonardo DiCaprio, more than anything. And when Agrippina passed away, he found his chance. Nero wanted his popularity to rise, so he began to put on performances of songs he'd written in public. <laughs> Cringe. His active pursuit of the arts did the exact opposite, however. Roman nobles absolutely despised professional actors and actresses, so to see their leader do such a thing was an embarrassment. He even arranged his diet and activities around his artistic endeavors. Despite some of the more gritty details of this cruel emperor, his passion for the arts by all accounts was genuine. It was just super, super desperate, dude. Like, calm down. Number six, personal hype men. I hope you enjoyed that Zoe 101 reference, and yes, it is somehow related to Emperor Nero. Did I think I would ever use Zoe 101 and Emperor Nero in the same sentence ever in my life? No. No, I didn't. Goes to show we can't plan life, it just happens. But Nero wanted to make sure that no matter where he went or what happened, that he would always feel like he'd accomplished something awesome. So he hired his own little cheerleading squad of personal clappers. Well, not quite, there's some details missing. When Nero visited Alexandria, he was very impressed with the fashion in which the Egyptians clapped. So he summoned men from Alexandria and made sure more than 5,000 men learned the Alexandrian styles of applause. Then he made them do so vigorously when he sang. You're my wonder wall, clap for me. The men had noticeable thick hair and no rings on their hands so they wouldn't get you know beat up so they could keep clapping. Number five, Antichrist. Was Nero the Antichrist? Well, a lot of people like to think so. Put someone really evil on Earth and that question always seems to appear somewhere. After Nero took his own life in 68 AD, spoiler alert, many people believed that it was a cover up and that he was still alive. Some men even came forward claiming to be Nero himself. Some of these men even stepped forward and sang in public like he used to do. Each of these men were punished, but rumors of his demonic survival continued. Prophets foretold his return, though that may have been more of a metaphor than in a literal sense. Nero was one of the most monstrous people of the time, so it's not surprising to think he is evil. From biblical forces to his crucifixion of Christians, which we'll get to later, the personification of the Antichrist was said to arise in the form of an emperor, which made Nero really match up quite well with that whole thing, so who knows. Number four, messed up love. So of course, Nero had his fair share of mistresses, but according to rumor, there was none closer than mummy dearest. That's right, we got some Oedipus Rex action right now, but that was most likely a rumor perpetuated against a hated tyrant, but still. Who can be sure? He and his mother often rode together in a litter and emerged with suspicious stains on their clothes, alleging what they might have done inside the litter. He also took up a mistress who looked a lot like his mother, which added fuel to the fire. Freud would have had a field day. But whatever love was between them would expire in 59 when Nero plotted to have his mother killed. His string of marriages were just as horrendous. His first wife, Octavia, he drove to take her own life. The second, he kicked to death while she was carrying. The third was his former mistress, whose husband he forced to take his own life so she would be free to marry him. Then there was Pythagoras, who was Nero's fave ex-slave. In 64 AD, they kind of married and Nero dressed as the bride. Nero also married another man named Sporus, who he also took away his manhood, should I say, so that he could be more of a woman in 67 AD. He took after his uncle Caligula when it came to taking advantage of the wives of his senators, which brings us to number three, animal games. I know, you know where I'm going with this. If you know where this is going, trigger warning folks, this man was warped if you hadn't figured that out. As I was saying, he was a really big fan of putting his senators into uncomfortable positions, putting them through massive ridiculous orgies, but he also devised an utterly horrendous and bizarre sex game where he would dress up as an animal covered in animal pelts, come out of a cage and attack men and women tied to stakes. But then when he got his like, you know, fill, he would go to one of his husbands to finish the job. In a way, he kind of sounds like an OG furry if furries were violent, but at the same time, Nero took his fetish way farther than anyone was comfortable with. Consent is sexy, unless you're an emperor apparently who literally takes 
takes lives if he doesn't get his way. He also allegedly had booths set up along the river he traveled filled with mechanisms for pleasure and concubines role playing innkeepers for his pleasure. That could be a rumor but honestly I wouldn't put it past him. Number 2 Night Lights just when you think things have gotten as worse as they could get, it gets worse. But of course, this is Nero we are talking about, not Robert De Niro. He's a nice guy. They didn't have electricity back then, obviously, right? So at night they had to have a way of lighting up the night. Now, most logical people would be like, yeah, let's light a few torches, use some fire. But Nero had a darker idea that conveniently humiliated and tormented the people he hated the most, the Christians. When Rome burned, Nero went on to shift the blame to the Christians. Thousands of the followers were rounded up and punished in incredibly cruel ways. But most notably, he built pyres, covered them with tar, and used them as torches for an imperial festival. Amongst the burning bodies, he had naked dancers come Come out and frolic around the poor victims. Going back to the Antichrist thing we mentioned earlier, I think this really makes like for an open and shut case. And last one, time to go. Okay, let's do a quick recap here. Bestiality, matricide, unalived his first wife and his second along with his kid. He basically bankrupted Rome by building his golden palace, raised taxes to pay for it, uh, violated consent in so many brutal ways. Nero to zero. Am I right folks? The emperor's Rome began to crumble and his officials were not happy. He would soon be declared public enemy number one. Not long after a Roman governor renounced Nero and his legion was defeated in Germany, it was only a matter of time for the tyrant. The praetorian guard charged with guarding the emperor himself renounced him and he was officially declared an enemy of the people by the senate on June 8th in 64. Nero knew he was done for, so rather than face the masses and account for his crimes, Nero took his own life to beat them to it. His last words were apparently what an artist dies in me and he died with his current mistress at his side she ensured he at least had a very decent burial but that was that for the tyrannical ruler kicking off the list at number 10 party hard the term boot and rally was added to the urban dictionary in 2002 but romans were riding that wave out a long long time ago they knew how to get down, well rather they knew how to get it up. Ancient Romans would often make themselves puke in order to continue eating and drinking. How gross is that? What would normally be a red flag at a house party was actually a sign of respect back then. But it was business. These parties, these long exhausting banquets, attending these was a sign of social standing. So you wanted to be around the longest, you wanted to drink the most, dance the most, and grossly enough puke the most. Those are the coolest Romans in town apparently. It was so normal that you would excuse yourself from dinner and be like, mm -hmm, excuse me, go to the vomitorium, great name, right across from the dining room. I'm sure it's a great breeze rolling through there. But then you'd go in this room, grab a feather, and then tickle uh, thy throat, and then make room for even more lobster. What a treat. Birthday parties were never so disgusting. Number nine, gladiator blood. When Charlie Sheen started talking about drinking dragon blood, everybody looked at him like he was insane, rightfully so, but back then if you boasted about drinking gladiator blood, well, you were on the right track. Ancient Romans believed that gladiators had the literal heart of a lion, and to be fair, they were in immaculate shape. With all that long hair as well, I don't blame them. So the thought process here, being extremely superstitious, was that if you drank gladiator blood, whatever disease you had, it would soon be cured. So these Roman physicians would tell their patients with epilepsy to chug some warrior blood like you're a vampire apparently it works like some of the time never really not really I wouldn't recommend this don't do this number eight you're in trouble recently we did a list on dark medical practices used in history and in that list we talked briefly about how urine was used by ancient Romans to whiten their smile hmm lovely fresh breath guaranteed well to dive deeper into this gross fact Romans also used urine to wash their clothes so after they were done washing up, they would mask the smell, or at least try to, with fragrant leaves. They would use bay leaves and just rub it all over themselves, which is interesting. They didn't use soap because the amount of ammonia used in urine, well, it did the trick. Lye was also used to clean clothes at this time, but it was too pricey. So plan B was to head down to the Folones, the ancient laundromat, where everybody would just catch up and stomp on their, you know, urine-filled clothes. Again, the smell is probably not that pleasant. Number seven, Roman art. If you've seen Superbad recently, this next one will ring a bell. I grew up watching Art Attack, okay? The British dude, Neil Butchanen, with his aggressive sidekick head that would just yell at you all day. What a fun way to learn how to draw. Well, back in the 18th century, when excavations took place in the city of Pompeii, they found lots and lots of art with a similar 
eggplant theme. I'm trying not to say what I really want to say here, people. Genitals carved everywhere. Carved, I said. Not just like, you know, drawn in Sharpie. Carved in the streets. Carved in the walls. Just under a street sign, you'll see one of these. Just popping out at you. Hello. Just generations of genitals. Rich history, folks. The phalluses of Pompeii. Imagine tripping over one of these. You do that thing where you look back to see what you almost rolled your ankle on. Imagine looking back and seeing that in the ground. I'd be like, okay, we're just gonna keep walking. Many tour guides like to say that they all point and lead to a brothel, when in reality, these were actually just for good luck. They didn't really have a purpose other than good fortune. These symbols were to ward off the evil eye. Most folk kept these outside their front homes. You know, right next to the mailbox. That's great, it's a good, pot, good spot to put it. Number six, new hair, new me. Glowing up these days is quite easy. Change your hair color up, throw on some jorts, listen to Adele's new album, Bob's Your Uncle. It works, it always works. But if you were an ancient Roman and you wanted to show off the new you to your ex, maybe at the vomitorium party, how would you change your hair? How would you do it? Well, it was common, but the way they used to get it done was all but. Romans would have to use goat fat and beechwood ashes to bring out those highlights. Maybe it's goat fat, maybe it's Maybelline. Again, like those crazy parties, this was a symbol of status. If your hair didn't reek of goat fat, who even are you? Get out of here. Emperor Claudius III, his wife Valeria, apparently she once dyed her hair blonde and then painted her entire body gold and then had a contest to see who could hook up with the most Romans in one night. I feel like this would have been a really good reality TV show back in the day. Number five, bathroom hangouts. Bathroom lighting is key when you go out. Those 1 a.m. selfies never looked or felt so good. Ancient Roman times, hanging out in the bathroom with your friends was quite common, but they didn't have any neon lights or quotes and selfies. It was just a lot of bricks. Oh, and also, it smelled really bad. They didn't have the Charmin Ultra less is more lifestyle. They had to use sticks with sponges to wipe. And yeah, of course, they also had to share. Socializing in these ancient toilets was like socializing at a Starbucks. It was normal. You would spend hours here and you got done, literally. Groups of Romans would discuss business, politics, military strategies, all the while a dude's in the corner just like going to the bathroom. Romans believed the goddess Cloquina was the guardian of the toilet drain system. Cloca Maxima translates to big drain. I guess when you invent the flushing toilet, you can call them whatever you want. Just don't call any meetings there, perhaps. Might be a good start. Number four, no soap. Sometimes you're in a rush, it happens. You don't have time to shower, so you do the classic spray yourself with cologne and then hope that you fool the world. It's a smart move, but the ancient Romans were way ahead of you. While they didn't clean their clothes with laundry detergent, it's not shocking to hear that they also didn't use soap to wash their bodies. Instead, they rubbed perfume oil all over themselves to get rid of sweat and all that jazz, but later on, once that oil had dried up, it was then removed with a wooden wedge or a spatula-like tool called a striggle. The world's most painful loofah, sign me up. Dirt and sweat would get stuck to this oil and then subsequently just peeled off. So it did work, but it took a little more time than our usual showers nowadays, our you know five minute rushes before work. For Romans who were well off, this was a whole event. There were several assistants, you could pick from all these fancy and fragrant oils. It was slow and sensual. How was anybody ever on time back then? Number three, all the poison. There's always the one kid who's allergic to nuts on your flight. And it's horrible, now nobody gets nuts on this flight. It's tragic, really. Research shows that feeding infants peanuts or peanut products when they're around four to six months old can prevent a peanut allergy. But Roman emperors had their own way of achieving immunity. It was common for Roman kings to seek out and then consume a small amount of each known poison because they thought at the end of this grueling trial, you would become immune to them all. It was a hot blend called Mithridium, named of course after the poison's creator, Mithridates the Great. He lived until he was 80, so maybe these potions that he created might have actually worked. The world's first vaccine, perhaps. Number two, thumbs up or thumbs down. Giving somebody a thumbs up after they've done something, it feels nice, you're like, yeah. Even a sarcastic thumbs up, use those when you get cut off in traffic. In the hit film Gladiator, there's a scene where Joaquin Phoenix's character gives Russell Crowe's character a thumbs up, and in turn, he lives, and then we watch cinematic redemption. In real life, ancient Romans used these thumb signs to determine a gladiator's fate in the Colosseum. It was referred to as policy verso. It's the Latin term for a turned thumb. The crowd would vote if a gladiator should die or not, which is also insane. It's like America's Got Talent, but like insane. While it's nice to receive a thumbs up after doing something today, if you got a thumbs up or even a thumbs down, it meant your days of living have come to an end. And finally, number one, animals in the arena. In order to spice up the classic fight and clashing swords till death action, sometimes gladiators would be put into the arena with an animal. 
instead of another human being. Were they squirrels, maybe an opossum? Or were they tigers or elephants, bears, lions, leopards, hyenas, wolves? Oh my god, they didn't win these often, did they? Animals were very expensive, so they weren't used all the time, but the organizers of the battle would go all out for the fights if they did include them. Like Logan Paul vs Mayweather, it's a big social event. Most animals who were used in these great battles unfortunately didn't make it out alive. That's the horrible part as well, I'm a big animal lover. So much so that I'm rooting for the elephants in these fights while reading up about this. This led to another important factor down the road. People loved when animals were included that eventually trade in exotic animals started taking place. This quickly took the hippo from the Nile and made them extinct. Now cut to today, thousands of species are going extinct. Number 10 is the annual exorcism that renders the whole month of May unlucky for marriages. Hence the proverb, bad girls wed in May. AKA Lemaralia, a whole private behind closed doors holiday dedicated to kicking ghosts out of your house. It dates back to hella pagan times, the 6th century BCE, and only seemed to tamper out around the 3rd. Held only on the lucky dates of May 9th, 11th, and 13th, philosopher Ovid tells us in his writings Fasti that Romulus began this tradition to appease the restless and angry spirit otherwise called Lemers in Roman times of his brother whom he killed. The head of the household was responsible for getting up at night, washing his hands in spring water, and walking through the home with his hands like this. He would either take a mouthful or handful of black beans and then spit them or throw them over his shoulder to the hungry spirits, repeating the following incantation nine times. I send these with these beans, I redeem me and mine. While dad is doing that, give your kids some pots and pans and tell them to reenact Stomp. The household member's role is to clash bronze pots while repeating, Ghosts of my fathers and ancestors, be gone. The householder washes his hands in spring water three times, rinse and repeat for three days, pun intended. The Lemaralia was meant to help those family members who had died in circumstances that prevented or delayed their admission to the afterlife. This could be dying before your time or through sudden disease, war, misadventure, or a circumstance that would prevent a proper burial. On the third day, they lighten the energy a little. A merchant's festival and fair was held to ensure a prosperous year for business. Number nine is how Rome couldn't handle when badass Carthaginian general came a knocking. It's the Hannibal invasion. The Carthaginians had lost Rome in the first Punic War, and that was no picnic for anyone involved. The fragile truce called between the nations of Rome and Carthage was tenuous, and Rome was taking more and more control over the Mediterranean Sea by the day, which both economies heavily depended on. Just like in a movie from the shadows of the concerned Carthaginians came Hannibal. The hot new young general on the scene and the son of Hamilcar, one of the best of the best Car Carthaginian generals. Now in the wake of his father's death with the Roman rage train rolling and something to prove, Hannibal forms his own plan, one that became known as one of the most significant historical events of ancient Rome. They would come to Italy and descend from the Alps. In the spring of 218 BCE, Hannibal led one of the biggest military journeys in history, and what would follow was a series of increasingly catastrophic disasters for the Roman Senate. The first major pitched battle at the River Tribibi in December of 218 saw over half the deployed Roman forces eradicated. The Roman consul Flaminius overreacts and pursues Hannibal's army into the hills of Lake Trasimene in June of 217, where they're ambushed and a total of 15,000 Romans are killed. Now a consul is dead and a significant portion of the army is gone. Instead of recollecting calmly, Rome continues to panic and the newly elected consuls are given 20,000 Roman men each, as well as 40,000 supplementary troops from Roman allies, stocking an army of around 80,000 men. Imagine being a civilian right now, just everyone is being called for draft men every day, they leave en masse, never return. It's with these forces that the consuls confronted Hannibal at the Roman supply base Cannae where he had taken, but he they did it without taking into account the flat terrain, heavily favored the Carthaginian cavalry. Lo and behold, it's a downright killing spree, and out of the 80,000 men who fought, only 14,500 Romans escaped death or captivity. Let's talk about some more Roman political fumbles in number eight, the year of four emperors. Nero, the emperor who started his reign fabulously, only to end it universally despised, was the first emperor to definitively take their own life. He did this with a lot of pomp and flair, but also without leaving an heir. This set up an immense power grab into motion, leading to the year of four emperors in 69 AD. So let's do a credit run for these guys, shall we? Galba, who follows Nero, pretty much killed every distinguished man without a trial for petty differences. But then, when the people of Rome called upon him to punish two corrupt legions, he gave them honors and promotions. He also allowed his friends to wield taxation and condemnation as political favors. He gets killed by his own guards and his body laid in the street until a common soldier saw it its head and delivered it to Marcus Salvius Otho. Otho, now elected emperor, immediately has Vilitilius on it. 
refusing all offers of peace settlements and demanding a battle. Otho loses 40,000 men to him, and the man who tells him this takes his life at Otho's feet. Otho couldn't tough it, so he said goodbye to his loved ones, dispersed his wealth, took his own life. The Senate immediately hands Vit Vitalius the throne to spare themselves more battle, who was a gluttonous dirtbag. Disregarding democracy, he mimicked Nero in setting himself up to be the supreme power. He held his position for eight months before the founder of the Flavian dynasty, Titus Flavius, suddenly had the legions of Syria, Alexandria, Mosia, Pannonia, and Aricum, declaring him the emperor. And the terrified Vilitius disguises himself with rags and tries to escape the city, but fails. Next is the emperor who essentially lived as if in a cartoon. Number seven is Caligula's reign. Living in Rome at the same time as this guy would be a nightmare on the sole basis alone. His favorite phrase was, remember, I have the right to do anything to anybody, because that is what you want to hear from your leader. And he was someone who took it quite literally. This included banging his friends' wives, or the torment and, subs and subsequent killing of high-ranking senators who dared to disagree with him. He even turned killing into a sport and just attacked people at random. Caligula famously caused a famine by draining the Roman treasury, having built vast monuments to his own greatness. After raising taxes to get some more petty cash, Caligula's spending quickly became out of control. In one famous incident, he arrayed for hundreds of merchant ships to form a three-mile-long floating bridge across the bay, which he galloped back and forth across on his horse for two days wearing a golden cape. Caligula wasn't like this at the beginning of his reign when he led a series of political reforms and even recalled all the exiles from outside of Rome, but something shifted after a few months which can be attributed to maybe a serious illness, leading Caligula to become increasingly erratic and deranged. He ordered his men to attack the beach and declared himself a god, appearing in public dressed as various gods and demigods. And he also removed the heads of gods statues to put his own atop. He was the first Roman emperor to be killed in a coup. On to number six, which is the crisis of the Roman Republic. The Roman Republic lasted for nearly 500 years, but the crisis of the Roman Republic was nowhere near as long, rather a decade of political instability that fed social unrest from 134 to 44 BC. During this period, Rome was often at war with its neighbors while simultaneously dealing with crippling civil wars and coups as aristocrats tried to hang on to their exclusive rights and privileges against the pressure from the rest society. So many captured people were brought into the country, it created an influx of free labor which hurt the lower classes and disrupted the agricultural system, forcing small farmers to sell their land. Wealthy people bought votes and gave favors to their friends. Bribery and corruption were rampant and led to commoners distrusting Senate, and without a police force, crime was out of control. When Rome's conquests declined, so did their sources of income. This decrease in money resulted in a lost support for the people of Rome and created enormous stress on that economy. Officials began to tax their citizens furthering the peasant rage. The rise of Julius Caesar as a dictator led to civil war from 49 to 45 BC and saw Roman armies fighting each other in Italy, Spain, Greece, and Egypt. This along with economic problems, government corruption, crime, and private arms all led to the eventual fall of the Roman Republic in 27 BCE. And since it ties in so nicely, number five will be the fall of Rome. After the Republic eats it, Augustus can be accredited with the establishment of the Roman Empire. He successfully curb stomped Mark Antony during the Battle of Atticum in 30 31 BC and Cleo takes herself out of commission. Augustus sets up an excellent governing system and military, bringing Rome wealth, trade, and, and very few military defeats. The empire reached its peak when the territory stretched from the English-Scottish border to Saudi Arabia in, in 117 CE with a population high of 70 million, which was 20% of the population of the world at the time. What he can't bring Rome, however, despite all the social reforms and religious control and successful conquests, is the peace they seemingly lost. The constant civil war, financial ruin, and clan invasions had demolished the kingdom's confidence, as proven by how far the barbarian clans even made it into the Roman territories. And when the city of Rome was sacked by the Goths, it led to the final fall of the empire in 476 CE. Number four covers the months following Caesar's death. It's the Alaskan volcano, which we now know is to blame for the unusual weather, plagues, and famines following the death of, as said, Caesar in 44 BCE. Ancient writers who survived the period described the sun's mysterious disappearance, unseasonably cold weather, short growing seasons if not completely failed crops, and widespread famine around the Mediterranean from Rome to Egypt. Throughout the empire, starvation led to disease and fueled growing civil unrest in already turbulent times. Sources document famines in northern Italy by April of 42 BCE and northern Greece of the next year. Famines are seen in Egypt, and it's tempeculate that they weaken that country, making it the perfect moment for Octavian to conquer and solidify his hold on the nascent empire. A recent study of Greenland ice cords now suggests that the volcanic culprit is Mount Okmok in what's now a Alaska, half a world away from Rome, whose smoke and smog block the sun and slow spreading sulfur affect crops. Letters from Cicero, the Roman statesman whose death in 42 BC is considered the symbolic end of the Republic, mention cold weather around the 
time of the eruption, and the dated accounts show the slow travel of the volcano's toxins through the empire. Speaking of toxicity in Rome, let's do mass expulsions for number three. These periods were known as the drastic points in ancient Roman history. Romans didn't really care for race or sexuality as long as you dressed, talked, and behaved like a Roman. That's all that was needed to be respected in their society, immigrant or otherwise. But without holding a Latin status, immigrants had very little protection. As a result, multiple times in Roman history, nobles and emperors alike decided to kick folks out and for a variety of reasons. You're a lawyer, doctor, or a construction worker, doesn't matter how helpful you are, you are out. Don't have a homeland to return to? Doesn't matter. Naturally, thousands would starve just outside the kingdom's gates for that reason. However, a mass expulsion could calm angry Roman citizens looking for someone to blame during a famine, war, or plague. Generally, something or anything that would cause shortages. Religions such as Judaism or Roman paganism was often a target for expulsion, as seen in 98 BCE and 177 BCE. Professions could also be targeted. Cicero writes of an expulsion of philosophers in 126 BCE. It may not be right, of course, for one who is not a citizen to exercise the rights and privileges of citizenship, and the law on this point was secured by two of our wisest consuls. Still, to prevent foreigners from enjoying the advances of the city is altogether contrary to the laws of humanity. In a time of famine, Suetonus talks of how Augustus expelled owned people and gladiators. Once indeed a time of great scarcity, when it was difficult to find remedy, Augustus expelled from the city the laborers that were for sale, as well as the schools of gladiators, all foreigners with the exception of physicians and teachers, and a part of the household servants. And what better to follow up expulsion? than something that caused one. Number two is the plague of 165 AD, whose victims would fall to fever and chills with diarrhea starting red that turned black within a week. During that time, black pockmarks would scab their bodies to peel off and leave deep ditched wounds. Towards the end, people would even cough up or excrete scabs that had formed inside of them. Like some beast, a contemporary wrote, the sickness destroyed not just a few people, but rampaged across whole cities and destroyed them. Victims would suffer for two, sometimes three weeks before dying or recovering by minor miracle. This was smallpox in its first form. The Romans had dealt with malaria, intestinal disease, wasting diseases, and worms living in putrefying wounds that would refuse to heal. But smallpox was something that began as a terrifying rumor from the east, spreading through conversation that simultaneously transmitted news of the disease and the virus itself. The smallpox plague remained in Rome for a generation, finding a peak in the year 189 when it was taking as many 2,000 people per day. It decimated the aristocracy to such a degree that town councils couldn't meet, local magistrates went unfulfilled and community organizations failed. Abandoned farms and depopulated towns dotted the countrysides from Egypt to Germany. Alrighty, last but never the least on the list, number one is horrific banquets. Roman history written between 211 and 233 by Dio Cass describes a hellish meal hosted by Emperor Domitian in the year 89. It was an event seemingly designed to torment its participants. The room was completely black, from the floor to the ceiling to the table. The guests, most of whom were senators, were each assigned a personalized grave gravestone seat. The food served was traditionally offered as sacrifices to departed spirits and it was all also colored to be black. Every single one of the guests feared and trembled and was kept in constant expectation of having his throat cut at the next moment, writes Cassius. Domitian apparently relished in their terror, conversing only upon topics relating to death and demise. Whether or not this dinner actually happened, it falls into a subsection of very real dinner entertainment from the past, categorized by the late historian Phyllis Prey Barber as black or hell banquets were designed to evoke funeral services at the least or afflictions of hell itself at the worst. One famous Roman account was in March of 1519, Lorenzo di Filippo Strozzi's home. It said that a few flickering candles revealed skulls, skeletons. According to one account, no one wanted to eat because it was such a terrifying scene. And when his guests couldn't take any more, apparently at least two cardinals vomited that day, Strozzi orchestrated the grand finale, cracking open the skull and bones to reveal they were fakes made of sugar and filled with roast pheasant and sausages. And the wedding traditions of both ancient Rome and the ones of our modern day, we need to learn about number 10, the women of Sabine. So if you haven't seen it yet, we recently released the top 10 messed up marriage traditions in ancient Rome, and I definitely recommend giving these two videos a watch consecutively. As in that one, you'll learn more about the traditions and the ceremony itself. This video, more nitty gritty baby. So to recap, this story first takes place when Rome was first established, like fresh off the press, just a small military settlement in 753 BCE. As a result, its entire population was men, which don't get me wrong, Roman soldiers could work with the same way Greek ones could, but because their mommies had done all the work for them their entire lives and now they can't wash 
dishes or even a shirt, they sought out replacement mommies, aka wives. Where and how do you get wives when there are no women? The answer to that question was to steal any women of childbearing age from the neighboring township of Sabine. These women were ripped from their mothers and fathers and carried in large processions back to Rome where they were forced into marriage via physicality. Their fathers, brothers, and former husbands came to wage war and win the women back, but the women of Sabine felt it was too late. Now forced into motherhood and marriage to the soldiers, the women of Sabine throw themselves in between the evil men who are now the fathers of their children and the men who they'd been stolen from, begging that bloodshed end, wanting to live neither fatherless nor widowed. So a truce is called and Sabine and Rome united their communities. So let's do a traditional breakdown in the following part of the countdown. What traditions ended up coming from this? Number nine will be stolen goods. So one result of Rome literally starting off as a mass theft of ladies and their autonomy, it developed a super fun mindset and tradition that the only bride of value was one that hadn't been deflowered and had been stolen from her family. This went in two directions. So first, marriage continued to be theft, not like a ha ha ha, steal the bride. This was like actual theft of a person and a forceful marriage. This is how it was in the early days of Rome for a few hundo years. Obviously it can't stay that way forever because people do feel love and some people want to get married in a non effed up way. So the tradition goes the second way, that theft would be continued but as a consenting reenactment. In a consenting reenactment after the marriage ceremony, a bride would hug her father, then hold her mother, at which point the guests and the groomsmen would pull her from her mother's arms in a recreation of what happened to the Sabines, and that she should cry out in pain and weep as she was heralded along the route to her new house, even if they were faking it, just as the Sabines had. And that's when number eight comes in, the best man. So before the theft was a reenactment and it was still the real deal stuff, the best man and or groomsmen were crucial. If a bride's family was to steal back their daughter before the consummation occurs, this man or men's purpose was to literally guard the bride and fight her family. That's why he was called a best man. He was usually whatever man the groom knew who was best at fighting. And if he didn't want to risk getting his own butt kicked, well, he better bring his groom's men. The more, the better. According to country living, the presence of groomsmen and best men was also to ensure that the bride, who in many situations was literally stolen, didn't make a break for it herself. This is why the best man stands up there next to the groom and bride instead of behind the door frame with a baseball bat waiting for his homie's new father-in-law to come break down the door. If a fight's going to break out, you need your best fighter right there ready to go or to tackle a runaway bride. Stolen or not, once you're married, it's time for number seven, the darkened threshold. The practice of the groom carrying the bride across the threshold of their new home or bedroom doorway dates back to the forcible actions taken on the Sabines as they fought tooth and nail to escape the soldiers. When it evolved and became part of a reenactment, the brides would continue to be carried through the threshold, but with a lot more steps in the process. So after that long and dramatic reenactment procession I mentioned, and the guests and the groom whipping walnuts at her the whole time to represent leaving childish things behind, since nuts, which was its name, was a child's game in ancient Rome. The bride would then be put down outside the front door. She would oil the door's hinges with melted tallow, wolf fat, or olive oil to keep out sorcery. Then she would hang some woolen strips taken out of her elaborate hairstyle on the door as a symbol of her taking over the traditional wives duty of weaving wool, but also to represent the scraps of material torn off of the Sabines. To go inside her new home, the groomsmen would then lift the bride over the threshold and into the house's atrium. The threshold was sacred to the goddess Vesta, so Romans believed that carrying the woman across the threshold would ensure she avoid tripping, a bad omen. This however is also a reference to the Sabine women being carried inside of captors homes. Number six, we move away from the Sabine reenactment specific traditions. It's now cuffed up. So fun fact, it was under Romans that the detailed legal requirements for engagements, weddings, and divorce were first instituted. Given that marriage in ancient Rome was something that required strict adherence to law, it may not be surprising that it was also regarded as a contract, thus a ring was necessary. Women in ancient Rome society were given two wedding rings, an iron one and a gold one. The iron was stylized in the early times of Rome to look like or even act as a functioning key, indicating their husbands owned them and they were a homemaker. This ring was worn at home, whilst the second was worn in public to impress people. The most common type of ring associated with Roman marriages was the fede ring, which has a design showing a pair of clasped hands or an entwined couple. Less charming is how they're representative of a contract that's comparable to farmer 
farmer buying cows. The ring would act as a receipt and passing of ownership between the father to the future husband. That's why only women wore rings, because men weren't property. Going hand in hand with that last point is number five, dowry on a finger. You know that whole selfish notion that if they really love you, they'll spend a fortune on a ring because that's what you're worth? Guess where that comes from? Creepy, right? Nowadays, it can be obvious from a ring how much someone paid for it, but back in ancient Rome, looking at a ring was how you established how much a woman was worth. And you could base how much you should respect her on that. Cheap ring, that means a small dowry and an unworthy woman. Yikes. In fact, author Karen K. Hirsch notes that rings were often used for this purpose in regular business transactions in Rome, making it very possible they entered the wedding ceremony with that mindset around the 15th or 16th century. The groom would offer a ring as a sign of his serious intention, offering up some collateral that the bride could keep if he decided to back out of the engagement. Rings were sometimes used as a deposit on the expected dowry or as a simple payment to the bride as part of her acquisition. For number four, if you got some bad luck, bouquet it. So, having a pantheon of multiple gods is going to create some strong superstitions. Gods were jealous and had to be pacified with gifts and praise so that they would behave and grant wishes. Sometimes these gifts took the form of a handful of wheat or garlands and fragrant herbs. The origin of the bridal bouquet stems back to ancient Rome when bridal couples would weave greenery and blossoms into garlands and crowns scented with roses or orange blossoms, adding herbs to honor the gods and promote fertility and good fortune says Valerie Gittleman. Strands of ivory illustrated the strong bond of matrimony and fidelity, while white blossoms symbolize sweetness and happiness. Sheaves of wheat, for example, symbolize plenty and good harvests, i.e. fertility, which alongside faithfulness were the topmost virtues of ancient marriage. These garlands would be found on the altar spaces, on the groom's head, wound into the intricate six vestal bridal hairstyle, and naturally in the cluster the bride carries, all meant to ward off evil spirits that might try to harm her. Speaking of hair, and bridal beauty, how about the Roman candle for number three? I talked about the flamium in the last video about Roman marriage, but more so about what it represents and its purposes. As you may know, had you seen it, the flamium is a oak yellow color. However, it didn't start this way, rather as a vibrant orange red color designed to look like fire so it would scare off evil spirits. Also, it does explain the name flamium to you. This flamium also covered the bride's entire body in a 360 style, and originally they were weighed down with like heavy leaf garlands, precious stones, real rocks if you're broke. This was to prevent her, or at least try to slow her down if she was to try and run away. Why the change to yellow? Sun fading on veils passed down through the centuries. The concern for evil spirits lessened. People like the color mustard yellow. I don't know, take your pick. What stayed the same was having to use a billion pins to keep the damn thing on. Thankfully, the six braid vestal virgin hairstyle was conducive to that, but it was also conducive to hiding weapons. Circling us back to the Sabine and captured bride concept. Before a bride was allowed into the marriage bed, it became code that all jewelry that could be used as a weapon by the bride would have to be removed, including hairpins, bracelets, rings, and necklaces. Turns out some smart ladies kept some blades between their veil and scalp to protect themselves from their unwanted husbands once behind closed doors. I'm sure their Sabine ancestors would have been proud of them. This one's a little odd, but you may now kiss the priest in at number two. Pre-Christianity, kissing in Rome was actually a greeting. Before you picture a hot and sloppy makeout sesh, that's not the case. I mean a peck or little brushy brush of the lips. It was done between strangers, nobility, and family. Hell, they had to put laws in place to get people to stop laying them on each other when pandemics would break out so less people would die. It wasn't a romantic thing in the slightest, common for friends to kiss one another's closed eyelids, necks, and mouths, and considered a great privilege to greet members of your own family with a kiss. This rule was not to be broken or followed incorrectly. As Christianity took root in ancient Rome, the act of kissing became shamed alongside nudity, intercourse, and just about anything that was natural. What did remain was the kiss of peace. These were initially acceptable between men and women, but over time, Rome went from a kiss-friendly to no-tongue-action township. Because God forbid you kiss someone thanks for the loaf of bread you bought and feel a tingle somewhere. I know you bought bread from her every day for the last 13 years before now and kissed her thanks every time, but you never know. Today could be the day you defy God and embrace the devil. Tisk tisk, Romans. Anyways, jokes aside, 
despite the casual greeting kiss and the romantic kisses before marriage being banned, the kiss of peace remained and one of the times that that kiss happened was at the marriage ceremony where the priest would turn to the groom and absolutely lay one on the guy. After that, the groom has to turn to the bride and give her some sloppy tongue action next. Idea was that the priest passed a blessing through his mouth to the grooms and the groom would pass it to the bride. Thus why the groom can kiss the bride and not the other way around. And last but not least, it's everyone's favorite gals, the bridesmaids, number one. Bridesmaids are as much a sight to behold as the bride herself, mostly because back in the day, they dress almost exactly the same as the bride. Complete opposite of the downright offensive thing some of y'all have your best friends wear. Girl, if you love her, you wouldn't make her wear that shade of pink that she can't. Anyways, the Romans believed that the bride, being so pretty, is easy prey for vengeful spirits that would harm her. Thus, the bouquets, the flemium, and now the bridesmaids, aka decoy brides. These maidens' purposes were literally to confuse evil spirits. They would dress identical to each other in an outfit somewhat similar to the bride's own. Since the bridesmaids would be surrounding the bride and look so similar to one another, it was believed the evil spirits would become confused and fly off somewhere else. Reader's Digest also noted the use of bridesmaids in a similar fashion to the best man, confusing rival lovers or even criminals seeking to take the bride. As a result, the tradition of bridesmaids wearing identical dresses to the bride persisted until the 1880s. Of course, modern bridesmaids who consider the role less of an honor than a job with the terrible uniform should consider something else noted by Reader's Digest. In ancient times, bridesmaids were literally the bride's maids. At least these days, you're getting drunk on a yacht with her. Number 10, parties of poison. Hindsight is 2020, which I find more ironic than ever since the whole thing that happened and is continuing to happen. Today we know that lead, especially in large doses, is not good. It's poison. But a lot of the pipes that the Romans used in their plumbing were made from lead. Their water had 100 times more lead in it than the water that came from the springs, which means every time they drank water, they were poisoning themselves. Some side effects include behavioral changes as well as weakening organs and vital signs, etc., which may explain some of the more questionable emperor behaviors or the fall of the Roman Empire because people got nuts. But to add insult to injury, the Romans used to sweeten their wine with something called sapa. Sapa is lead acetate, the sugar of lead, which is, and it's also a salt, which is confusing, and therefore poison. Since Romans could down as much as two liters of wine in one sitting, they were slowly poisoning themselves, first with water, then with the wine. Speaking of wine, moving on to number nine, we have you better love wine. If you're a vodka or a beer person, you might not fit in while partying with the Romans, especially if you hate wine. Wine was the lifeblood of ancient Roman parties. Wine was drunk at every stage of the Roman party, but it had to be diluted with hot or cold water. Unlike how we drink wine today, which would be crazy if you were to dilute it. Whoa. It was looked down upon to drink wine in its purest form. It was served out with ladles, usually by naked and attractive male slaves. To heat the water, the Romans used special boilers, but if you really wanted to be bougie, they would add snow to make it cold. Considering they didn't have fridges back then, imagine the lengths they would have to go to to keep the snow cold. Beyond temperature, Romans absolutely drooled for calda and mulsum. Calda was great for cold nights. It was kind of like a mold wine, it was served hot and infused with spices. Molda was infused with honey and a lot sweeter. I want to try and make both. Maybe I will on my Instagram. Let me know if I should in the comments below. Minus the lead, of course. Number eight, seating charts. If you have ever been involved in a wedding, you know how important a seating chart is. Or like even in school, when you're like assigned desks, it's a big deal. You could end up sitting next to your uncomfortable cousin or beside your smelly Aunt Sue. It could determine whether the conversation flows or it's stagnant the entire night. Ugh, hate that. Romans understood the matchmaking game when it came to banquets. It was a pretty big deal. Where you sat determined your station and overall how liked you were. They had a three couch system called the triclinium. The most honored guests would sit on the couch in the center next to the hosts on the right. But if you were on the couch on the left, it kind of meant that you weren't as big of a deal. Sorry. Eventually as parties got bigger, so did the three couch rule extend to a huge semicircular couch in the middle that could hold about 12 people. Number seven, gladiator fights. 
We just did a video on this, Taylor and I, go check it out. Now, parties weren't just about eating, drinking, and socializing, there had to be entertainment, of course. Roman parties were designed around the five senses, taste, touch, smell, sight, and hearing. So of course, there were the ancient Roman bards jamming out some earworms, but what was there to look at? You could only watch someone play the harp for so long. Next up on the entertainment list was acrobats, dancing girls, even mimes, which I was surprised to learn, plus trained exotic animals. If you were more like the charcuterie and like a quiet evening kind of person, you might enjoy poetry readings. But what really got the party started was an epic gladiatorial battle. Nothing like putting sharp objects in drunk people's hands. But that wasn't all they did. Parties were a big deal and nobles loved to outdo each other, so sometimes they went too far. More than once it got out of hand, but the most famous was during the reign of Emperor Elagabalus. He wanted to shower his dinner guests with flowers, so he built a false ceiling filled with them, but the flowers somehow ended up smothering some of his guests to death because he just kind of went overboard. Death by Roses. That's a poem title right there. Stick to poetry nights, my friends. Number six, Saturnalia. One of the most popular Roman festivals, it was kind of like an early Christmas celebration, kind of, except it wasn't at all. It was actually about the god Saturn, not Christ. Oops, but it did take place in December. December 17th, to be precise, for three days. But people loved it so much, it soon got extended to seven, a whole week. All work and businesses were suspended, so better do your shopping on the 16th. Slaves were even temporarily free to do as they pleased. Even moral restrictions were eased. A mock king was chosen, and candles, wax fruit, wax statues were all given as presents. The practice of candle giving was to symbolize his son returning after the winter solstice. A statue of Saturn bound at the feet would be untied and invited to join the party. The houses were adorned with wreaths and greenery, kind of like Christmas, and singing, dancing, gambling were all common features. So kind of like Mardi Gras and Christmas combined. Number five, the Black Banquet. A prank that went down in history. Don't worry, this is nothing like GOT's red wedding. Thank goodness. Emperor Dominican had a pretty sick sense of humor and decided to host a party about it. In 90 AD, he invited a crowd of aristocrats to a banquet at Palatine Hill. When they arrived, the entire palace was decorated in black. Black velvet drapes, marble, everything was painted black like the Rolling Stones song. Even the food was black and everything was illuminated by funeral lamps. Naked serving boys were painted from head to toe in black paint and served food and drink to all the guests. When they sat down, their place marks were, were tombs with their names on it. And instead of lush couches, they sat on cement slabs. So basically he was like, yeah, sit in your own grave. Dominion had killed several senators in the past, so everyone believed that they were never gonna get out of there alive. It was like a huge metaphor for their own deaths. The emperor himself babbled about death and decay the entire night. So after the party was over and the guests made it home with their necks intact, Dominion sent gift baggies with their tombstones and onyx plates and a now clean serving boy ready to do their bidding. Turns out the whole thing was a prank and the emperor was back at the palace laughing his butt off. Number four, Bacchanalia. The party that was so wild, it got banned. One word, orgies. The Romans dug that kind of kinky shindig, but they like to pretend they didn't. Bacchanalia, the bad guy, is a term used to describe a drunken, debaucherous party at frat houses or sororities, which isn't far off from the heyday. The Bacchanal celebrates the god Dionysus, also known as Bacchus, literally the god of wine and a damn good time. The celebration could include massive feasts, ritual parades and performances, and people carrying clusters of grapes around, and of course, wine. Lots and lots of wine. It used to just be held by women three times a year, but soon men were slowly admitted to the festivities and they started making it happen about five times a month. But this was the breeding ground for scandal as it was rumored orgies and even human sacrifice occurred. So they were banned in 186 BCE, and if you ban something, you'll only make it more popular so the celebrations continued covertly. So if you're into that kind of stuff, maybe forgo the human sacrifice, but there it is. Number three, power play party. I've never lived within the aristocracy. I'm a blue collar gal. I'm never gonna know what it's like to be that rich, but I'm pretty sure this kind of who can throw the bigger party mentality hasn't really changed. In ancient Rome, parties were an opportunity to show off the amount of power a nobleman had. As soon as guests arrived, the extravagance and the rarity of the food, the vessels with which they were presented were all judged as soon as they were seen. Wine goblets 
goblets and jugs had to be functional yet exquisite, made from luxurious materials like gold, silver, and precious stones. Back then, a middle class family could afford silverware, so imagine what the nobles could do. This display of wealth played the long game, and it could mean political favors could be made down the road. So, sneaky sneaky. Number two, Party Island. This is where it gets really dark. Ever sipped on a Capri Sun? Well, this story may taint that memory, so fair warning. The island of Capri became a rich retreat for the Roman aristocracy known for its sadistic debauchery. Emperor Tiberius laid claim to this island as a haven for his horrendous and horrific, horrific behavior. He brought really young, too young male and female people of the night to serve him at his villa. The island became a kind of party place with absolutely no limits. From orgies in the caves to tormenting his servants on the rack as entertainment, Tiberius seemed to be the god Pan incarnate. In fact, he acted like it too. He made all of his participants slaves dress up as nymphs and goats while performing lewd acts. The island even became known as Goat Island with Tiberius being called the Old Goat. Ugh. Unless you enjoy dangerous games and gross parties, this definitely wasn't the party island fit for anyone. And last but not least, number one, Caligula. Caligula's parties. Let's not go there. If you're a fan of Roman history, then you are familiar with the two most horrific emperors that ever were. One of them was Caligula. Though he started out pretty good, after an extreme bout of fever, his disposition entirely changed. Maybe it was because of the lead. We don't know. Many believed he was insane, as his cruelty knew no bounds, even when it came to joy joyous occasions. Caligula's thing was that he liked to embarrass the wives of his officials for some reason, and also his officials. He would force specifically married couples to his banquets, and then steal the wives away throughout the night and then violate them against their wishes. But his torment doesn't end there. He would then relay to the entire party everything that he did in graphic detail and enjoy the frozen shock on everyone's faces because they couldn't do anything about it. It's no wonder he was eventually assassinated. Even at a party, this guy knew how to kill the mood. He wasn't the only emperor to turn the dial on creepy, Tiberius, when the party started, but if you had to choose whose party to go to, this one plus Tiberius, both of them, just don't go near them. Go to another time frame. Just imagine it otherwise. Number 10, a tin hut? The Roman army, baby. It's rough, it's tough. And worst of all, to their enemies, they were organized. But something every Roman soldier had to go through was some intense training. The training lasted four months, that's too long, started with intense marching and eventually moved into sparring. By the time they were finished, they were able to march 20 miles in full armor. A paid military rank and highly effective, the Romans were a formidable fighting force and an inspiration to many, including some ideas that are used in modern militaries today. While not having a perfect win to loss ratio, the Romans are probably most remembered for their military prowess, techniques, and weaponry. They got some cool spears. The theme, or really their best tactics, was teamwork. Roman legions worked as one. It would make them a very worthy opponent for many opponents. Number 9, Lonely Romans. I don't know about you guys, but after conquering lands and marching for days, I would be tired. As much as the Romans hated barbarians, some of them were tough and cost the Romans many lives in battle. So it would be best for the Romans to fight their hardest in order to come home to their families. Well, that wasn't exactly the case for Romans as they were not allowed to be married. Not until the second century, that was. All that unaliving and conquering. And no one to come for you from all those horrors of war. I would need a hug for sure. However, like a lot of rules, they were meant to be broken as some higher ranking Romans in the military did take some wives. And honestly, can you blame them? Number eight, short straw. Roman soldiers were professionals, maybe too professional. In the time of the Romans, there was the occasional deserter or mutiny. However, the Romans had a simple solution for this, or rather a pretty wild one. Something called decimation, or the removal of tents. Basically, after an offense has been committed, you and nine buddies line up to draw straws. Whoever draws the shortest straw gets unalived by your remaining nine friends, often by stoning, clubbing, or stabbing. That's just, that's just great. This punishment was not just limited to grunts, but open to any rank and anyone who dared disobey the Roman military code. Cause they're Romans and that's just how the Romans do. Forget about it. I spoke to the legionnaire of my army today, who just so happens to be the chief. And you know what he said? That's not it. Number seven, the Battle of Cannae. 
This was a hard day for many Romans. Maybe it was its overzealous confidence from conquering so much after losing so little. However, after facing the mighty elephant riding Hannibal of Carthage, the Romans were about to get a piece of their own medicine. Over 40,000 Romans would meet their ends in the Battle of Cannae. I can only imagine the confusion and humiliation the Romans must have felt. The battle is considered to be one of the worst days in Roman military history. It's also considered to be one of the greatest strategic military victories in history. From the bad guys, or the Carthage at least. I mean, they beat the Romans in the one thing they are really good at. That's like me trying to beat Michael Phelps in a swimming race, and then me winning. Yeah, never gonna happen. Which I'm sure if I did would shock absolutely everybody, including myself. I'm not built for swimming, I'm built for sinking. That's just how it goes. Number six, the Battle of Carthage. It wouldn't be a good story without a little revenge, would it? The Third Punic War was the last time Rome and Carthage would engage in combat. Rome began the siege of Carthage, and it was a brutal fight. Carthage did everything they could to repel the Romans, but Rome was powerful and was ready for their sweet revenge. Eventually, the city could no longer repel the Roman attack and was captured. The city was completely destroyed, and those who survived the siege were taken by the Romans and sold off into YouTube's least favorite S-word. The Romans had fought hard against Carthage and were probably glad to be rid of Hannibal and his war elephants. Yes, that's right, war elephants. He, he trained elephants to kill people. Like, that isn't so insane that you could train an elephant. Number five, civil unrest. Imagine you're a farmer, poor, hungry, and tired from tending fields all day long. Or you're a merchant in a city who's doing their best to get by. When you hear the thunderous marching of Roman soldiers approaching your position, the Romans are here to Romanify you. Or something like, there's no verb for that, I guess, I don't know. There's a good chance if you don't accept the Romans at your front door with open arms, they would force you to anyway. This means a lot of Roman soldiers dealt with civil unrest at home and abroad. And sometimes people just didn't want to be Roman. Kind of makes sense. Kind of a broad point too, but this is just how it goes when you conquer that much. The Roman Empire was one of the largest the world would ever see. Eventually, she would fall, due to many factors, but the civil unrest was always there. At least we still got the Colosseum though, right? Pretty cool. Number four, Wizards of the Barbarians. The spookiest enemy of the Romans, no doubt, was the Druids, religious-like figures who aided the barbaric hordes in many different ways. Romans did not like them, and they wanted them gone. You could almost say they wanted to purge them, like a certain hooded Sith that purged the galaxy of those treacherous Jedi. Execute Order 66. Unfortunately for the Druids, they got a bad rap, as almost everything we know about them is written by Romans, who were their enemies, and they weren't exactly that nice when speaking about them. So were they actually magical ritual practicing wizards? Maybe, but always remember that history is written by the victors. A lot of Romans are great because they told us they were. However, for the average Roman soldier at the time, any amount of propaganda about weird wizard people it was probably believed, as there's no trusted reliable sources of information back then, like Wikipedia to fact check, because they always have facts. Number three, barbarians. Barbarians are basically what all Romans called, well, basically non-Romans. Uncivilized, brutal peoples living outside of Rome in the lands that Romans so wanted to conquer. More specifically though, the Goths from Gaul. In what is now modern day France, many times the Romans would find themselves engaging with the people of Gaul. Conquest and assimilation is the name of the game. And like the other tribes and cultures in proximity to the Romans, they weren't exactly going to take it sitting down. Eventually the tides would turn in their favor and every Roman soldier's worst nightmare would come true. Rome was sacked by Gaul in 390 BCE. The horrors. Number two, Attila the Hun. Probably the most ruthless enemy the Roman Empire ever faced. Every once in a while, someone rises in the ranks in history and becomes a well-known conqueror. He ranks up there with the other big bad boys. Going against the Hun was to be a formidable foe. He conquered many lands before taking aim at the Roman Empire. I can just imagine the dread on the Roman soldiers' faces when they realized who they were going to be toe-to-toe -to -toe with. However, in the end, the Romans would claim victory, and Attila was defeated and perished during his attempted conquest. Number one, being a soldier. I mean, let's be honest. Through everything I've said, the Roman army was made up of soldiers. Sure, it may have been a very long time ago, but it's, it's still the army. And I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I am certainly not brave enough to be in the army. All my respect and love goes out to any soldier in the armed forces. Thank you for your service, seriously. But being in a modern army may be tough, 
But imagine being in the Roman army. I mean, you gotta walk everywhere or, or sail everywhere, and you better hope the enemy is close, because otherwise you're gonna be walking or sailing for a long time. And as a tubby boy with asthma, I would not fare well in the hot Mediterranean sun. With excessive walking and a diet of wine and bread, trying to swing a sword while bloated must have been the biggest challenge yet. No thanks, I'll pass. 